Okay, this is a sound check for the assembly chamber's audio system. Before our meeting, we're going to be checking all those uh, microphones that are in use and checking to see if there's too much of an echo in the room. Uh, I'm hearing a little echo, not a whole lot. So I think this one is fine. We're going to go around and do it for all the microphones. Um, and I'm going to ask Nate Abbott if he really is in attendee mode on Zoom. Nate, can you raise your virtual hand and let us know if you are hearing the audio coming through okay? You are. Wonderful. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Signing off on microphone number 1-3. Well, Akira, thanks for joining us. Can you do an audio sound check on your end so that we can be sure and hear you on uh, Zoom and in the room? And yep. I'm going to ask the rest of the folks in the room to quiet down a little bit so we can hear this. Can you hear me okay? Test, test, test. Test, Please. test, test. I can hear you. What's coming over the speakers? Go ahead, Well, Akira. Try it again. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yes, now we can. Thank you. Okay. Just thank you everybody who's joining us and I want to beg your indulgence and your patience as we do do a sound check for every single microphone in the room as well as our, we just did one for Wallachie Doc, who's our one person on Zoom and her sounded just fine. So Madam Mayor, on your microphones for each of you, there's a little sticker and it says what your microphone number is. Can you say what your number is and then do a sound check individually starting with the mayor? Sound check for 2-1, sound check. Sound check for 1-5. Sound check 2-5. Sound check 1-7. Sound check 1-4. Sound check 2-4. Sound check 1-6. I don't have a microphone, Madam Clerk. Uh, sound check one dash two. Sound check two three. Check one eight. How come I'm the only one who got corrected? Because I might swap your microphone. Sting again, 2-7. Yeah. Testing 2-3. Yeah. Oh, that sounds good. Testing 2-2. Two, two. This is public testimony and presenters. I think we're good. Last but not least, 1-8.
We'll bring the assembly committee of the whole meeting to order at 6 p.m. on April 15th, 2024. Uh, Madam Mayor, will you please read the land acknowledgement? Certainly, Madam Chair. We would like to acknowledge that the city and borough of Genoa is on Clinkley land and wish to honor the indigenous people of this land. For more than 10,000 years, Alaska Native people have been and continue to be integral to the well-being of our community. We are grateful to be in this place, a part of this community, and to honor the culture, traditions, and resilience of the Tlingit people, Grinolchish. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Madam Clerk, will you please call roll? Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Bulagidang. Here. Ms. Atkinson. Here. Mr. Kelly? Here. Ms. Wall? Present. Mr. Smith? Here. Ms. Ms. Hughes Scandies? Here. Mr. Bryson? Present. Deputy Mayor Hill? Here. And Mayor Weldon? Here. The quorum is present. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Are there any uh, changes to the agenda? Or is the agenda approved? As written, it is approved as written. Thank you. Uh, we will move right into agenda topics. Uh, Madam Manager, and please kick us right off. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Hale. I have a PowerPoint presentation to walk you through the memo. So this is not new information. Uh, the, the pictures you've seen before, uh, with the exception of a couple, and the um, information is in your memo. It's just a way for me to organize my thoughts. And so uh, this after this evening, what I would like to do is get uh, feedback from the assembly on two questions. Is the assembly comfortable moving forward with negotiations to lease Burns Building for all downtown CBJ employees? And if we, uh, if the assembly gives that direction, that's taking Floyd, Dryden, and Redrake off the table for office space, in which case I'd like guidance on a uh, process for soliciting ideas from organizations for the use of those spaces. So those are the two questions that uh, I want to be um, in the back of your head as you uh, go through this, walk through this memo basically. And See, this is the clerks would say this is actually why we provide printed copies, Katie, even though I'm like so much paper. <laughs> um, so I am just going to proceed through the presentation and we can quickly catch up. Um, Madam Manager, are there copies of this presentation in the back of the room if we need them, if people need them? But if people in the audience need copies, are there? Uh, there are copies in the red folder at the back of the room and copies on each of your desk in a red folder. Thank you, Madam Clerk. So after the last uh, Committee of the Whole, the Assembly directed staff to look at what uh, we could get out of $16.3 million at Marie Drake. So that's the uh, appropriation that the body has set aside for City Hall improvements. And uh, we went back and it kind of expanded the scope. You, if you recall from the uh, last Committee of the Whole, the range was like 13 million to you know, 25 million for, for a different variety of improvements. The, the reality is uh, renovation at Marie Drake would still be pretty basic um, at a $16.3 million model. There would be uh, paint and carpet and uh, lots of um, finishes would be improved. And if the, most of you went on a tour of the facility, so you are familiar with what that would look like. Um, a lot of that cost goes into building workstations, so putting cubicles into each classroom. Um, but what it doesn't allow for is re reconfiguring walls. So that uh, means that, all right here, so the first, uh, go to the next slide. Oh no, okay, okay so this is a, a slide you've seen. That's a, a classroom in Marie Drake, that's a bathroom. Um, so it would allow for upgrading some of those uh, the finishes in there, carpet and paint, um, and in the next slide. But what you have at Marie Drake are small classrooms. For the most part, there are some larger cl classrooms. But there are a lot of small classrooms just because in the 60s, classrooms were smaller. And so what that means, be if we're not pulling down walls, is you have these really tiny six by six workstations, uh, and this is just a, an image of a workstation, you also don't have great delineation between departments, right? So like 
uh, we have a certain number of workstations that we can shove in all the classrooms, but that doesn't mean like these three classrooms are engineering uh, and, you know, these four classrooms are, are CDD. It, it um, makes for that flow not being as easy. And so next slide. This is just another image of the workstations in that space. You can see the kind of cubicle partition that gives a, an employee a little bit of space, but it really is um, a tight a tight fit. Next slide. All right, next slide just talks about um, Redrake for um, City Hall and for um, um, Chambers. And again, you guys have seen this slide. This is the Commons at Marie Drake. And um, the next slide shows a layout of uh, what the Commons would be. And you uh, recall that uh, ceiling is very low in there and it's another awkwardly shaped building, which is uh, one of the reasons why you have such struggles with sound quality in this room. Um, so those are, um, those are some of the challenges with, um, some of the challenges with Marie Drake. Now, if we go to the um, next slide, Two slides, because this one's out of order. See, this is this is what happens when you, all right, um, Floyd Dryden. Okay, that's just a, a, a picture of Floyd Dryden to express how huge it is. Um, we did not do any specific cost estimating with Floyd Dryden because um, the, the most challenging facility really was Marie Drake because it's older and it hasn't had a recent renovation. Floyd Dryden has had a re recent renovation, but if you go to the next slide, um, you can see that the finishes are um, much nicer at Floyd Dryden, but we still would need things like carpet and paint and we would still need workstations. So there's probably not, we didn't do a cost estimate of what you could get for $16.3 million at Floyd Dryden. But the reality is turning Floyd Dryden into office space probably wouldn't cost leaps and bounds less than Marie Drake, just because a lot of the things that you're doing retrofitting classrooms for office space are going to cost the same regardless of kind of like how nice the paint is and the flooring is. Um, so those are just some uh, some pictures of Floyd Dryden currently that you guys have seen. Um, and the next slide is uh, again the um, chambers at the potential chambers at uh, Floyd Dryden. This is the current lunchroom and this actually is probably a little bit more challenging of a room or, you know, it's an interior room and again, it's got low ceilings. Um, probably one of the most compelling reasons uh, to not put uh, City Hall in Floyd Dryden, there's of course the location removing um, City Hall from downtown and we talked about that at the last Committee of the Whole on the kind of spend and the vibrancy of uh, a City Hall downtown. But also there's been a lot of community interest. There's been a lot of community interest in both, both facilities and, and we're gonna talk about that also in this section. But um, Floyd, Dryden, Floyd Dryden specifically um, has community interest for uh, things that probably would, uh, the residents who live in the Valley would appreciate more and um, certainly childcare is one of those. And we actually have a, a couple of representatives from uh, Clink and Haida here. Uh, they have come to, uh, to the city with a uh, proposal for doing childcare um, and Head Start out of uh, Floyd Dryden. And so I just want to recognize um, that we have Amelia Rivera and Roald Helgeson in the audience. And, uh, Chair, if you want to um, invite them up uh, to talk a little bit about their, their proposal. I would love to do that. Uh, Mr. Helgeson and Ms. Rivera, uh, if you'd like to please come up. And um, if you have any other uh, people that you wanted to introduce who are with you, um, you could just give us a, a, just a little bit about what you're proposing. We will have a more in-depth process later for making those proposals, but it would help the assembly. And go ahead and introduce yourself and then please let us know. Oh, uh, thank you. Sangait uh, Laadi Talong, Hoot Hangi Hinduri Kiong, Roald Helgeson, Yats Harakil, Hindu Di Kyung, good people, um, good day to you. My name is Roald Helgeson, my Haida name is Hoot Hungi. I'm the Chief Operating Officer with the Central Council of Sungit and Haida Indians of Alaska. With me today is also um, Giyash Ach, who is Amelia Rivera, and then uh, we have Misha Jackson, who's also in the audience today, who's with, uh, they are all with our Cultural Heritage and Education Department. At Clinkett and Haida, 
within our cultural heritage and education, we operate several early education programs across Southeast Alaska. Here in Juneau, we have uh, slated, currently have open three Head Start classrooms. Really, we're set for four Head Start classrooms. We also have what we call the Little Eagles and Raven's Nest or LEARN program, which is a, uh, which is a child care center. And then we have Hayu Hatangi Kuti, which is a Tlingit language immersion program for uh, pre-K. And so what is exciting to us is a lot of these kids are now matriculating out of uh, Hayu Hatangi Kuti and they're ending up in the TCLL program and we're seeing wonderful results for that. The issue with Floyd Dryden for the for the city, uh, and while it's we all recognize the challenge, it also is an opportunity where uh, Clinket and Haida would be interested in having conversations with the municipality to talk about how we might be able to utilize that space. Right now, we're in about 14,000 square feet spread all over the city. Uh, in some cases, we're in other schools. Uh, we're located there and we appreciate that opportunity. But the thought of being able to bring all of our programs for early education together into a single location is a concept that we've been exploring in other communities around Southeast Alaska, specifically Klawak and Craig. So this gives us an opportunity to have a dialogue about having space where we can be co-located, that we can get the benefits of the economy of scale that's there and it might also solve some of the challenges that the city has at the same time. Our team was out there today, and I mentioned 14,000 square feet, but please know 14,000 square feet to us has been out of an issue of scarcity. Uh, and so that's not really what we need for square footage. We need significantly more than 14,000 square feet. Uh, and as we look at the space there, this gives us an opportunity to think about Head Start classrooms being at least 20 in, uh, in size and number. And then when we talk about our little eagles and raven's nest and thinking about infant rooms and toddler rooms in addition to uh, the, the th uh, three to five year olds, that's a different environment and we could spread out a little bit if we were in that kind of space. So as we look at it conceptually, we're looking at uh, as not looking at the modulars, but looking at the main Floyd Dryden facility, we're probably talking about anywhere from a third to the half of the space, probably the seventh and eighth grade sections of the building is uh, what we've been thinking about. And I know this is early, but somebody needs to put it onto the table to say, we're interested. We're interested in having a dialogue. We're interested at, in this opportunity for how we might be able to lease that space from the city. Uh, that offsets your costs, but it also can give us uh, a good opportunity to co-locate and uh, benefit from that economy of scale of being in the same place. I might leave uh, Josh Osh an opportunity to say anything that she would want to add. Ms. Rivera. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would like to add that we're serving approximately 140 students right now. Um, and we are serving anywhere from birth all the way up to age five. So that's a significant part of the community. And if we were able to align our services and have our teachers on site in the same place, I think it would serve a lot of families well. They could let a student move from classroom to classroom if they had issues with childcare. And we would also be able to provide robust services and really aligned services for our kiddos. So thank you for your consideration. Oh, thank you. Thank you both so much. Uh, did you have something to add, Mr. Helgeson? I, I did, and I missed a very important piece, and that is there's a basketball court in there too, which is a high priority. Uh, and so our thought as well is um, if the municipality starts looking at how you might use that space, we hope that that would also include some sort of access to the gymnasium for our youth. We know that not all days are days that we can really play outside, but play is important. And then the other piece is we would have to have some kind of a conversation about a playground. Obviously, it's it's set for a middle school right now. We would have littles that would need uh, to be able to play outside for, for uh, when it's not inclement weather. And uh, obviously, that would be a cost to Clinket and Haida, but we would need to also talk about just space. Where would you do that? And there is space out there to make that happen, hopefully on a sunnier side of the building than the shady side of the building. I grew up in Sitka, I know you're going to tell me, no, it just rains. So. <laughs> oh, yeah, like today. Um, uh, Mr. Mr. Helgeson and Ms. Rivera, thank you very much. Are there any uh, questions from Assembly members? Um, uh, what's that? 
high level brief questions. Uh, Mr. Bryson. Uh, I'd like to thank you very much for coming because uh, my impression about Floyd Rod is that child care is the right, that's the right uh, location to have child care. Um, the question that I had is, uh, as you mentioned, your uh, little Ravens child care program, uh, would, would you guys be, what am I trying to ask? If we needed a whole bunch of child care, say like 20 classrooms worth of child care, and you guys were initially thinking a few classrooms, would you be able to scale up and provide all of the child care that might be needed? Or would you see just providing the child care and the classes that you guys are setting and then maybe the other another part of the building having other people provide child care? Have you given any thought to how much child care you might be able to provide along with uh, Head Start programs as well? Thank, thank you, Mr. Bryson. Mr. Hellison. High level enough. Oh, well, thank you for the question. Uh, I'll tell you that we had not contemplated that. We did contemplate the fact that we have licensure to operate here in the state of Alaska, and we have to pay attention to that licensure includes uh, includes a certain number of staff for the ch children that we have in our program, for the students we have in our program. Um, we certainly see the need in the community of Juneau for uh, child care. Uh, it might be something that we can look at uh, growing a little bit ourselves. Obviously, staffing is going to be the challenge. I think that's going to be a challenge for any of the child care centers. We've heard about child care programs closing, so that does matter. Uh, Mr. Bryson, you mentioned uh, something that is also important, and it does make sense that whoever goes into this space, that regardless of what programs you put there, adjacencies matter. So it would make sense that if you have something that would be for students, even if they're pre-K students, that you not have something that would detract from that uh, in else other parts of that building. So it makes sense that maybe there would be space for more than one early education center in that location. And we might be interested in expanding some as well, maybe in partnership with the city. I don't know what that looks like, but what I do know is opportunities exist. Uh, thank you, Mr. Helgeson. Are there further questions, brief questions? Uh, um, well, Doc. Yeah, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I don't, I, I, maybe I missed this, uh, Roald, but did you, did you mention the number of students that are currently uh, being taken care of by both your child care and also Head Start? And then I was also wondering, I'm going to go for two for here, if it's okay, uh, if you would consider um, we know that the, the Juno Commission on Aging has, has, has been proposing that maybe there's some kind of child, elder, uh, you know, kind of combination of the two in one space, as we've seen in other communities throughout the world, how that has been beneficial for both our elders and our youth. And so I don't know if that's also a consideration for you folks. Uh, Mr. Helgeson, thank you, Ahal Gidak. Ahal Gidak, the answer uh, is we have anywhere from 120 to 140 students right now. Um, and then of course, you heard that we have one classroom that is currently down and we'd like to bring that back up. The other answer is that we are quite interested in opportunities where elders interact with youth. Uh, we are working with another community, with a tribe in another community in which we are co-locating separate buildings, but on the same campus, uh, our early education center which really has the three programs that I was just talking about, and they're going to have a senior center. We see curriculum being developed between elders being able to be involved in the daily operations of educating our youth. So we're bullish about that, we think is positive. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Helgeson. Um, uh, Mr. Smith, did you have a question? No, no, no question. Um, I want to thank you, Hawa, for being here, and thank you for everything you do uh, for members of our community. It's greatly appreciated, so thank you. Um, thank you, Hawa. Uh, Madam Manager, thank you. Thank you. So I'm just going to jump back into a couple more images um, to, to walk the assembly through the Burns Building as an option, because 
Well, these, these two topics feel separate, they're also connected. So it's my hope to kind of walk through this memo with you and then uh, take on those questions um, in, in the order that they were presented of leasing the Burns building and then um, moving forward with fluid drain and marie drain. So um, you've seen this picture, uh, the Burns building. Um, Another uh, takeaway that we had at the last committee of the whole, this is a picture of the chambers and it's got, a, I mean the chambers at the Burns building really would be a nice fit. It's a, the Board of Education met there. Um, it's 25% uh, larger than this room. Again, it's a, it's a building that was used for a very similar purpose. Um, so if you go to the next slide, you will see a layout of um, chambers in the Burns building. Do you notice how the room is square? <laughs> I shouldn't overpromise the solving all of our problems with the square room, but I really think that would help. Um, but, but anyway, at the last meeting, we talked about the Burns building and we came with a cost estimate for uh, tenant improvements at the Burns building of, um, and that's just another image of, um, of chambers. Of, we came away with a cost estimate of um, five point, um, I believe it was $5.1 million. And that really was to take some of the exterior walls down if many of you also went on a tour of that facility and um, the uh, kind of, as uh, Chair Hill says, the muckety muck offices are on the outside with the windows and that leaves a lot of interior cubicle space windowless. And so that um, over $5 million estimate was to move those walls and kind of flip that footprint so that the, the most amount of uh, employees would have that exposure to natural light. I asked uh, staff to go back and give like the most basic cost estimate for tenant improvements without tearing down walls and doing those things. And so that's where the 3.3 million comes in. So we can think of tenant improvements as a range, um, you know, from 3.3 to 5.1 million, depending on uh, the level of those improvements. And let's see, then the next slide. I believe talks about um, the administration building is a key piece of- Madam the, Manager, yes. um, if, if I may, I just wanna point out that Ms. Tracy Ricker, who represents the uh, Burns building in the negotiations um, is, is here in the audience if, if that comes up or if we have any questions. Thank, thank you for you. being here. Thank you for being here. Um, making the Burns building work is also uh, using the JSD administration building, which is in a block from there. And these are again, pictures that you've seen, um, but this uh, has 17 workstations, could probably fit more. How we use those will of course depend on how we move forward, but it really makes, uh, kind of lets us out at the scenes a little bit. Um, we were struggling without the, um, without that building uh, to make that spot work. And there's, the proximity is, is really close. So we feel like that's a, that's a great um, an advantage. Um, so um, let's see, next slide. I'm not sure what my next slide is. Oh, parking. Parking is the Achilles heel of Marie Drake. Um, I mentioned in the memo that at Marie Drake, there's about 45 parking spots. That's if you take all those spots in front of the track. That's if you take up spots that frankly will be filled in the absence of parking enforcement by uh, the high school students as you consolidate the high school. Um, you know, I think you could probably get another few parking spots if you remove some gates and some trees and get really creative with parking, uh, probably 20 spots or so. But Marie Drake has parking challenges and we'll talk about that a little bit when we talk about uses for the space. Um, but this map, you've seen this map, uh, there's parking at the Burns building we have about 165 to 180 parking passes. Um, um, 180 is the summer number, 165 is the winter number um, at the marine parking garage. So we still would have some parking needs, but you see about uh, 0.35 miles away is 450 Whittier that has 45 spaces. The reality is when the state uh, fully occupied that building, they had the same requirements to provide their employees parking that we have in our contract and they made it work and we believe they made that work uh, by using a combination of leased city property for parking. And so naturally there'd be, a, there'd be an advantage to getting to work early <laughs> to get prime parking. There'd also, that would also be an incentive to use alternative means of transportation, uh, like walking to work or taking the bus to work. And you know, there's, there's other challenges with, with, um, with busing that we hope to improve. 
um, in ne next fiscal year. Um, but the reality is it's still a puzzle to figure out parking, but many uh, employers have done it before us and we, we feel like with the Burns building, that's really a doable puzzle to figure out. Probably the um, next most important, and I don't know if I have any, I don't think I have anything else. These are just the, uh, the questions that I, po I posed to you in the memo. So we probably don't need to have that um, on the on the screen, uh, Madam Clerk, if you want to switch over so people can see each other. But probably the um, next most important thing is the cost of the Burns Building. While we haven't negotiated a final lease, we do. You recall we are moving um, Muni Way employees into the Burns Building, so we at least have a, a number, and um, we've been given a range of numbers to work with. And so, in your memo on page three, talks about. Um, the uh, the cost of leasing and so the Burns building plus the JSD admin building the, because there would be an operational cost in there is about 1.55 million again those tenant improvements range from 3.5 to 5.25 million that includes Burns building and JSD uh, tenant improvements mostly furniture office furniture and the status quo which is where we all are now, including the cost of maintaining this facility, not improvements to this facility, is 1.25 million. And we've all been in lots of conversations about the ever unknown and escalating costs of, of making City Hall a uh, climate controlled, comfortable uh, facility. Um, so that is um, talking about the buildings. And I guess, uh, Madam, Madam Chair, do you want to pause there before I launch into? to public process, because I feel like that might be a separate topic. I think it is a good place to pause. And uh, <clears throat> do people have questions? I have one, uh, Ms. Wall. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I appreciated kind of, the, uh, you know, the um, work you all put into kind of thinking about what 16.3 would get us in Marie Drake or Floyd Dryden. Um, what I don't know is kind of if is that is that better or worse than our, what we have right now? Recognizing I know our buildings right now are um, we don't own them or they're falling apart and have a lot of maintenance needs. In terms of like if you were to build these um, you know workstations for the majority of our staff, is that a downgrade to what they're currently experience or an upgrade or? if you could speak generally. Madam Manager. Yeah, so I will speak from that, from experience, having worked in Marine View um, and City Hall now. Um, I think for some employees, Floyd Dryden would be uh, an improvement because we have a lot of employees who live in the Valley and so that would be convenient for them. Um, you still have the kind of cubicle and classroom feel, which would be challenging, um, but uh, bigger classrooms, so so easier to, to manage. Um, talking about Marie Drake, I think that the parking challenges combined with the old facility and the, you know, inefficient layout, like how would we do the permit center? I mean, I'm sure we'd figure it out, but just all these challenges of trying to provide these really forward public facing services in an efficient way, I don't see, as much as I really wanted to be excited about Marie Drake, I don't see how we uh, make that space more efficient for um, providing city services. Now how staff will feel in there, I, I think they might prefer their like, poorly climate controlled offices with unreliable uh, bathrooms to being in six by six cubicles. Um, I don't know if Deputy Manager Barr has anything to add to that. Deputy okay. Manager Barr. Just agreement. <clears throat> um, did you have a follow up, Ms. Wall? No. Um, uh, Ms. Uskanis, and then the Mayor, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have so many questions, so I <laughs> uh, don't know where to start. Um, I will say I love an awkward shape. I'm uh, sorry, what was that? I love an awkward shape. I feel like a lot of hate on awkward shapes in this memo. Um, I guess one question when we are talking about, just, just levity, uh, when we're talking about uh, improvements to the Burns building, uh, the chamber is very, uh, the Board of Education room is very 
similar and square and that is really you can picture how that would be easy the other floors i unfortunately was not able to make that tour um having done time in there as a state employee in the cubicle farm as it is it was very uh you know kind of plug and play i would imagine for city employees it would be very similar to even if it's different than what they have now it's certainly acceptable and there i guess when i'm looking at these numbers and thinking of improvements to that what the what the the primary need is i guess or I guess, you know, some of these things have obvious, like we would need to change this because, and any improvements we, or reconfigurations we made to the Burns building, what is the because? Madam Manager, did you understand that question? Yeah, I did. And, and I had similar questions, of course, because I'm like, can't we just bring our old furniture in there and plug into the internet and go? Um, and, uh, you know, certainly we could still scale that uh, renovation down, but that um, on page six kind of details, and it's a per square foot number, so it doesn't have that level of detail, but it's carpet and paint and um, cubicle partitions and new furniture and um, cable and wiring to every workstation and, and uh, things of that nature. Mrs. Kennedy, do you have a follow-up, not another question? <laughs> No, I'll chew on that. Thank you, Madam Manager. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Madam Mayor, and then Mr. Smith. Um, so my question is on the Floyd Dryden and Marie Drake. Um, I know we're going to look at soliciting um, other entities to, uh, if they want the space, but do we have other options for city departments? And the one that I've heard of is um, building maintenance. Can you talk about that a little bit? Madam Manager. Yeah, um, certainly uh, the public has not been the only group that is looking at those facilities with creative minds. Uh, one uh, city um, employees have as well, and one idea that's bubbled up is moving building maintenance into Murray Drake, which would be more centrally located, which makes it more efficient, right? Less windshield time is less time we're paying people to drive, essentially. Um, and then Mount Jumbo Gym is really our Mount Jumbo itself. Uh, not Mount Jumbo, Jumbo, the facility, um, is in a great location for housing. So, you know, there's a bit of a puzzle piece of, like, if we move certain city facilities, could we achieve other um, assembly goals? So I think the creative juices are spinning from within uh, city uh, administration as well. And we will include those in our, I, our smorgasbord of ideas that we bring to the body. Uh, thank you, Madam Manager. Uh, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Um, Ms. Kester, is the the number that you showed at the top of page three, the, you know, the lease operating per year at the Burns and JSD admin, is that, the, is that calculated the 285 per square foot number or is it at a lower one? Madam Manager. Um. <laughs> I believe that's at the 285 uh, rate. I'm looking at the land manager who's looking behind him to wonder who I'm looking at, but <laughs> but he helped me uh, come to that number. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Smith. Uh, Ms. Scandies, did you have additional questions? Um, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. A question um, that is not related to the number on this page, but I do think is relevant to, as we're looking at all these different things floating out there. Hypothetically speaking, had the city voted for a new city hall, I'm wondering, and perhaps you all addressed this in your last uh, meeting, I wasn't able to be there when we talked, we started talking about this pre-tour. Do you have any sort of estimate about what the length of time would have been that, you know, what we would have done if right now we had that site that we had proposed and because construction doesn't happen overnight, what our plans would have been had City Hall passed, because to me, I think this is that's relevant to think about in this conversation. Yeah, Madam Manager. Yeah, no, I've definitely thought about that. Um, so what I would have proposed to the assembly um, is a spit polish of this building. I mean, enough to just like, like maybe we could do a little bit to manage our 
temperature better, paint the exterior. I mean, we'd still have to invest some money. Uh, I'm sorry, you, your first part of that question is timeline. Four to five years, probably, from passage till we're like fully in an operational in a new facility. Um, probably status quo at Marine View and, you know, negotiate a lease, like a five-year lease with some um, very basic tenant improvements, which the owner would be w willing to do. Um, the, the kind of wild card that I hadn't anticipated was that um, Muni Way would be such a difficult work environment during construction. That was our fault for not understanding that. Um, so we would still need to be finding them um, a temporary solution. Our temporary solution right now is moving those 31 employees to the Burns building. I can't guarantee that that would have been our same temporary solution had we been like in October, as soon as construction's complete, we're moving back into that facility. Um, so that's the, the piece that's probably a little bit harder to predict given the changing nature of, of the world. Thank you, Madam Manager. Are there um, further questions from other assembly members or I don't see any, Ms. Houston. Oh, Madam, Madam Mayor. Um, this is probably for Ms. Ricker's ears, but um, um, as if we decide to go ahead with negotiations on leasing the Burns building, I'm assuming um, if prices change or anything like that, we can certainly look at the other buildings still. We aren't locked into anything until we complete that negotiation, correct? Madam Manager. Absolutely. I mean, I think that we have seen how much the universe can change in less than a year, so. Thank you. Good question, Madam, Madam Mayor. Um, Ms. Uscandis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I have a question about parking and I'm, there were different numbers flying around and I tried to jot those down so, if, and I'm not gonna quote them because I don't think I caught them all. Um, my takeaway was that okay. we can get a high percentage of parking, but then maybe the overflow is further away and if you want prime parking gets there earlier. So one question, uh, if I'm speaking in a slight two-part, it would be, what are there regulations around that? What as far as besides providing parking for our employees, but like a distant sort of thing, obviously for disabled employees, they, there's a process to get a, a handicap permit or something like that. Um, if you could speak to that a little bit and we talked about cam capital transit today in public works, but um, for as far as for alternate methods, there is not, we're not currently running something that someone could do like a park and ride situation and get here by eight o'clock, is that correct? Um, Madam Manager. Let's see, so um, parking, the first, there's 87 spots uh, that come with the lease and we have 165 uh, to 180 parking permits that we issue. Some of those are CBJ vehicles I'm not sure if we would leave our CBJ vehicles in the marine parking garage. Uh, we've got a nice gated area. We have electric EV charging stations there for city vehicles. Uh, that would have to be looked at from an efficiency perspective. Um, so it could be that that number of required spots goes down. Also, you have about 30 of those spots are docks and harbors, employees in the summer, like they would just park in the marine parking garage. So that kind of picks that issue. Um, I do not know of any requirement in our contract that requires parking to be within a certain number of, of feet. Uh, the overflow parking, which is which would be at the uh, 450 Whittier site, which is also, of course, where the Jack and um, Centennial Hall parking are, and we've, we've got a lot of, of surface parking that CBJ owns there. Um, it's 0.35 miles, so it's definitely a, a walk. Um, but we, uh, we, we believe that that's probably part of the parking solution before at, for the state employees at the Burns building. Um, then your other question was about capital transit. Improvements to the express route uh, with a, uh, during the summer seasonally would probably help um, at least seasonally uh, allow for uh, better kind of commuter traffic. And certainly if there's demand, you know, we do right now provide a bus pass to employees in addition to a parking pass. So that is, um, a, incentive that we have. And I don't know how many employees uh, would uh, live close enough to walk to work, but it is 
even more proximate than City Hall right now to flat people who live in the flats. And, and we would probably get an uptick of people who exclusively walk. I don't know if that would be um, significant. Thank you, Madam Manager. We have Mr. Smith and we have Madam Mayor. Mr. Smith. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Um, Manager Kester, you had on that map at the back, the I think it's a, like the Dawson lot that's over by the, what was the old Bill Ray Center. Is that, an, is that an option at all? Have you discussed that? Uh, Did I miss this Madam before? Manager. Uh, from what I understand, that lot has been used in the past uh, for parking. Um, from what I also understand is that Dawson values that property as lay down yard for their downtown projects pretty highly, so it's unlikely they would enter into a long term long term parking lease with us. Of course, that's an option that we uh, would explore. Thank you. Uh, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. So currently the um, school district has their services servers in Marie Drake. Would they keep them there and would we no matter what's in that building, put our servers there, or what's the IT plan? Uh, Mr. Deputy Manager. Thank you, Madam Deputy Manager. Um, we we are working on an MOA with the school district to so that they can maintain their uh, their servers in that in that room. Um, whether or not uh, we moved into that room, I think, would be dependent on what decisions you make around this topic. Um, but if we were in if, if we were in the Burns building or Marie Drake, we would likely move our IT equipment into that facility as well, into Marie Drake. Uh, assuming, I'll let assuming, sorry. Okay. So I didn't quite hear you. If we were in the Burns and Marie Drake, we'd likely move them to Marie Drake? I didn't quite hear that. We, we would likely consolidate uh, our, so there's a little bit of synergy between the school district and us, um, and we would likely uh, we would likely see the benefit, the value of having our equipment in the same space as their 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 as their equipment in Marie Drake, regardless of which facility we chose. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Manager. Um, Mr. Kelly. Uh, thank you. Um, just a little bit more on the on the topic of parking. Um, I, I guess I, I'm also kind of thinking of the possible puzzle piece of moving our our maintenance into Marie Drake, which might open up some parking at the Burns building. Do, do we have an estimate of how many uh, parking spaces if we move maintenance over into Marie Drake um, and the rest of us um, in, into Burns, for example, how much um, parking spaces that might open up? Madam Manager. Marie, um, building maintenance is currently located on Douglas Island, so uh, it would not free up any um, any parking spaces. Thank they would take some spaces uh, of the 45 at Marie Drake. Thank you. Are there further questions? Mr. Smith and then Madam Mayor. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Um, just a question on building parking. I, I noticed at two points in this packet for the price for constructing underground parking at Telephone Hill and then the parking garage, they both estimated around $90,000 a spot. Is, is that that's those are equivalent. I would, in my mind, I'm just like building parking underground just seems like a more expensive undertaking, but maybe they're anyway. <laughs> oh, so your Madam question Manager. is how come Telephone Hill underground parking wasn't more expensive than $90,000? I, uh, I was just kind of spot. curious that like those two projects would be the same price. Anyway, and, and no problem. We can follow up. I, I guess my answer would be that was a, a rough um, a rough cost estimate for uh, for telephone hill based yep. on per square foot numbers and yep. we, we um, got some those numbers from um, well I we have experience with those numbers I can't say that the project team got those numbers from but when we were looking at 450 Whittier and underground parking there okay thank you Are there further questions? Oh, I'm sorry, Madam Mayor. Um, so I'm gonna do a two for like what we all got did. Um, number one, I don't see in your estimates for Marie Drake any mention of asbestos. I understand at least the locker rooms are still have it, and I'm assuming that um, that doesn't include any tech uh, asbestos abatement. And then number two, 
because we're talking about locker rooms, we're still making sure that gyms in both Murray Drake and Floyd Drive, and no matter what is there, will be open to the community. And I'm hoping that my assembly agrees with me that we keep the planetarium. Uh, Madam Manager. Um, you are correct, Madam Mayor, that uh, the cost estimate does not include abatement. What um, Marie Drake has done is uh, uh, leave in place like the, the lockers and not occupy the locker rooms, which both haven't been abated. The gym and some of the other large spaces at Marie Drake have been abated. The second part of your question about gyms being, um, gym space being opened and available to the public is something that I'd like to get guidance with uh, from the body on for this kind of second part of this conversation if we move forward with a solicitation from organizations. Are there further questions? Oh, oh planetarium. Um, certainly the assembly could direct, uh, could direct that whatever use uh, of Murray Drake would include public access to the planetarium. Thank you, uh, Madam Manager. Uh, I kind of see a, a, a splitting point here. We could uh, answer your recommendation question number one at this point, or we could finish the conversation. Do you have a preference, Madam Manager? No, they're just so uh, linked. But I could also appreciate that the body might not want to, you know, dive all the way into Burns without looking at some of the community uses for um, for Marie Drake and Floyd Dryden. So, it, you know, it's a little bit chicken and egg, and that's why I presented it um, as such. But I think we can move forward with the discussion on um, on guidance for those facilities if, if the body is comfortable with that Burns question um, sitting out there. Let's do that. I'm seeing nods from members of the assembly. Let's do that then. Oh, Madam Mayor. So I would move that uh, the have direct staff to proceed with negotiation on leasing the Burns building. Um, and that's why I asked my question, even though we're going through negotiations until they're finalized, we can still look at other options there. Mm. Madam Mayor, we were just talking about going through the rest of the presentation or the memo first, um, but, but- Oh, I thought you wanted, I'm part, sorry, I thought you wanted a motion now. Never mind. Um, I can withdraw my motion. Um, if you don't mind, I think maybe we should go ahead and uh, go through the rest of the memo first. Sorry about that. Madam Manager. All right, so on page two of the packet, and we do have a slide, but um, I think we can probably manage uh, just uh, looking at the packet here. <clears throat> um, We've talked a lot about the two facilities, and um, I have some potential guidance that I'm looking for from the body of a solicitation process to interested organizations. I want to emphasize that we would be asking organizations, not like the public, what they would like to see there, but organizations that truly have an interest in providing a service at these, um, at these facilities. And so <clears throat> some of the guidance that we would uh, we would issue like we would issue a press release um, and ask for letters of interest from organizations really trying to keep it high level so that we're not requiring like big you know we don't have a uh, we don't have an appraisal we don't know what we'd be leasing them for but information like are you willing to pay, pay farm uh, fair market rent for this space questions like that so the idea would be that we issue this solicitation as, uh, as soon as we can turn it around after this meeting, and then the Public Works and Facilities Committee reviews the first round of submittals um, for that solicitation. This gives time then for staff to go back and say, hey, the committee had some questions. Um, you know, we want to know a little bit more about your idea here or there before we take those options to the committee of the whole. So um, just to list uh, some of the things that staff came up with, um, Projects would be given prior, or uses would be given priority that are assigned with assembly priorities and goals, child care and housing being uh, two. The impact on the CBJ budget would be considered. Obviously, if uh, an organization is willing to pay for lease costs and some depreciation costs, that's a, that's a huge thing, right? Because you guys saw a mill rate increase to cover the operational costs of these facilities. So anything that can defray that will help our taxpayers. Parking is going to be a big issue, especially with Marie Drake. Probably uses that require less parking, like childcare, where you don't have um, 
you know, every child doesn't come with a car uh, that needs to be sitting in a parking lot all day, those, those type of things. Um, level of retrofit needed for the proposed idea and who would pay for it. Child care, again, probably needs like lower toilets, but doesn't really need a whole lot of change um, their classrooms, whereas other uses are gonna need, um, need more retrofitting. And then uh, compatible uses, so if multiple tenants are using the same space, are those uses compatible? And we talked about that a little bit already today. And then um, the direction, as the mayor mentioned, of keeping the gym spaces available for public use, especially after uh, regular business hours. I think we're going to see a lot of requests for that gym space during, you know, school hours or, or, or work hours. Um, but really prioritizing making those, you know, like community centers where people can go and play, pick up basketball. And I mean, there's just endless uses in a uh, rainforest like ours for indoor space. So I would love to um, turn that back over to the body and get ideas and additions to that list. Um, Mr. Bryson and then Mr. Kelly. In the form of a question, Madam Deputy Mayor. Yeah, if you could phrase it as a question. Uh, so, Madam Manager, um, if the Assembly uh, had an idea like Juno Animal Rescue, a service that we are providing, contracting out, as one of the ideas of a potential uh, organization to go into one of these facilities, at one point would we want to include that information or have that be part of the discussion? I'm talking about Juno Animal Rescue and the Floyd Dryden Music Wing. Um, Madam Manager, uh, ideas for other parts of the community that other, some people have thought of. Yeah, no, I think this is a great time, and that is a project. That is a project, and we because that conversation has been ongoing. We will make sure and close the loop with Juno Animal Rescue on that that particular topic. Uh, but that is an example of an impact on CBJ budget, right? Finding a useful space for Juno Animal Rescue that allows them to continue to provide their mission. That you know. CBJ funds a portion of would have a positive impact on the CBJ budget. Thank you, Madam Manager. We have uh, Mr. Kelly and then Ms. Wall. Mr. Kelly. Thank you. I thought this was going to be comments period, so I'll pull Bryson. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I like that you, you mentioned the idea of possibly um, a low, uh, a, the possibility of somebody using the Marie Drake space that would be a low car yield space, like a childcare. Uh, would, sh should such an organization, I'm not saying it has to be childcare, but some other organization that had, didn't have a large need for the parking spaces, um, lease that space, would we be able to negotiate perhaps or arrange that CBJ could have some of our overflow parking in that area? Well, good question. Madam Manager. <laughs> I think I understand the question to mean if there's 45 parking spots at Marie Drake and the intended use only needs 20, can we use the other 25? Um, I think that we would be, we want to look under every stone for parking. So I would be, I would be uh, happy to do that. Also knowing that I, I find it unlikely that 70,000 square feet of space won't need 45 parking spots, but I love where you're going with that. <laughs> and, and we'd have to, people would have to get there before the high school students. <laughs> um, thank you, Mr. Kelly. Uh, Ms. Wall. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> um, this question <laughs> hopefully isn't a super stupid question, but I have to ask it. Um, and I know, because I know there's complicating things about schools, and I know these are no longer going to be schools, but um, is there any reason we can't, and I'm not saying I want to do this, but so I understand the universe of possibilities, um, that someone, that we couldn't, that these buildings couldn't change ownership? Madam Manager, that's another good question. There is... Uh no reason that they can change ownership and I think we toyed about putting that on there and whether or not that would just be a, a, a squirrel so <laughs> so um, I I think that um, that's totally possible uh, Madam Mayor but just pulling off Ms. Wall's question which was not stupid so during our solicitation process we can solicitate for people to actually buy the building too uh, 
Okay. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And Ms. Wall, did you have a follow-up? Sorry about that. Ah, you asked. Um, are there further questions or uh, suggestions for additional uh, guidance, et cetera, at this point from the Assembly? Mr. Smith. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Um, a couple of comments. I, I guess I'm just kind of looking at the timeline and I just, I'm just seeing that, you know, on 5 May 6th, I think that's three weeks from today, would be reviewing submissions at PWFC. And that would mean you probably had to have application, you had to have submissions a week before that. I'm just wondering if this timeline just seems just a little too fast for, for the community to, you know, like, you know, get, to get the information out for them maybe to have questions. I just wonder if it's a little too quick. Like there's just not enough time for, for the community to submit ideas. That would, I would, I would maybe want to push it back a little bit. Yeah. Uh, Madam Manager, do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, if you would have seen the slide on this that I had up, it w the question was, uh, is this a timeline too aggressive? Because I think we, I share your concern. I'm also, um, like, when I look at the, the calendar and I think of, like, all the meetings that we need to, like, make movement on this, I'm like, in three years, we'll have a use for these <laughs> facilities. So I would be happy, and I think staff would uh, breathe a, a sigh of relief. My way of kind of countering that with, with uh, internally was, well, we could just we'll keep a very high level. It won't be the end all be all, but it'll allow PWFC to at least start talking about it. And maybe some submissions will come in later and maybe that'll allow for some dialogue. But I appreciate that uh, possibly a little more time and a tighter process. It, it all depends on kind of what our end goal is. And, and for me personally, I'm looking at wanting to offset the expense to the CBJ budget if that's the direction that the body provides as soon as possible. So totally, uh, totally noted. Thank you, Madam Manager. We have uh, Ms. Hughes Scandies and then the mayor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Madam Manager. That last comment, I think, helps me understand a little bit more. I'll just add a comment that in the time that I've been on the assembly, this is by far the most ambitious timeline I have ever seen for a lot of moving pieces and not only a lot of moving pieces, but very consequential for the community pieces. Um, I, I guess um, foreshadowing when I asked how long it would have taken if the ballot measure passed and we were building city hall, I think it's important for us to be a, a good employer. Uh, I think it's important for us to be mindful of how we house our employees and as you know, stewards of public money, how we use public buildings to their highest and best use. Um, but I have real concerns that there have been, I, I don't, I think the sort of underlying guidance in what should we be thinking about? How does this align with our goals? How does this impact our budget? I don't have issues with these core principles, so I think that's fine. I just think as a body, we really need to think about, is this something that we need to move at the speed that we are considering moving it? Um, something like employees being in a work zone that to me is an immediate sort of, oh, well, we have to take these employees out of a work zone and put them somewhere. We're not getting OSHA violations. Um, what should we do with three buildings that we didn't know we were gonna get and we lost this and we have two other things happening drastically affecting our budget? I don't know that that's gonna lead to the best decision-making for the next 50 years for the community. So my feedback uh, would just be that I really think we need to take a look at this timeline, even though I normally complain about the speed of government, and I will later in this agenda. Um, but in this case, I think we should stop it, perhaps, and uh, make adjustments to that. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Gannis. Uh, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. I'm hearing what people are saying, although I think we've been approached, and we have to remember that these are supposed to be entities and organizations by several of them. And I'm also assuming that um, following Mr. Bryson's question about JAR, that we are actually gonna send letters out to, I know 
uh, we'll make sure AEYC, which is child care, um, JAR, the animal rescue, and other entities um, that we know might be looking for space. So um, I think if, with that being said, I think it might be slightly aggressive also. But. And I, before I solicit additional questions, I, I wanted to follow up myself on that. Um, I think that uh, when I was speaking with, with Madam Manager about this earlier, um, and you very much clarified it, we are, this is not an RFP. We are not asking people, I mean, people could submit one page, right, with a proposal, an organization, right? So we're not asking them to do an enormous amount of work. Um, we're just asking them to tell us what they are thinking of and um, I, I, at the same time, I understand the, the timeline concern. I also think, you know, hearing the proposal um, by Clinkett High to Central Council, <clears throat> we have an upcoming school year, and maybe there are things that could happen in one or both of those buildings, Murray Drake or Floyd Dryden, that could take advantage of them being vacant in the upcoming school year, and that would be really terrific if that's the case, if not a huge amount of retrofitting is required. And my last comment on that, and Ohal Gadak, I see you now, um, so I will, I will call on you next, but my last comment on that is, um, I, I understand your desire to save money in the budget, but we may not be able to do that for FY25. We may have to eat the cost in the next fiscal year, or at least part of it. That's my thoughts. Uh, Ohal Gadak, and then Mr. Bryson, and then Mr. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I was just thinking about um, as we're as we're taking in considerations, and I'm sorry if, if I missed this. There's been a lot of a lot of discussion so far, um, but uh, for me, there has to be also be a consideration of you know an organization that just wants to uh, lease out part of it, and how that fits with the other organization that just wants to lease out part of it. Um, you know, something that that hit me is you know Juno Animal Rescue. Um, yeah, awesome. But if we put them with elders, if we put them with children, if we, you know, if we're thinking about these considerations and how they fit together or don't fit together or, or a really bad idea to put in the same building, um, we need to really be thinking about that as well. Thank you, Wahagi Duck. Um, Mr. Bryson and then Mr. Kelly. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Uh, just following up on uh, Juno Animal Rescue, there was a good couple of doors that you could close. 15,000 square feet would be sectioned off. And that was the square footage that Juno Animal Rescue uh, was initially looking at as they were talking about a new facility. Um, so we spent two years trying to figure out how, what we could do as it, to build a new city hall because we knew that our city hall operations were inadequate. And we looked at the school question repeatedly to find out if it was a good idea to put city hall into a school and the answer both times that I recall that we went down that path and came back, it's not a good idea. It's just as expensive to renovate a school in the city hall as it would be to build a brand new one. And with the schools having um, access to so many more activities uh, and we haven't even touched on what the community would like to see done with the schools. I like Manager Kester's bold approach. Thank you for being bold, Manager Kester. We've had a, this in front of us for years we can delay making a decision what we're going to do with City Hall, but one of the options was build a brand new office building. The second best option for City Hall was to go occupy an office building. Those were the two most logical, cost-effective ways to do it. And now we're being given an opportunity to go into an office building with the lowest amount of uh, taxpayer dollar required to, to make that a City Hall. I mean, it's a gift for us that we don't have to dump a lot of money into, and it covers a lot of the things that we're talking about, deferred maintenance and uh, maintenance in general. I bet you shiny nickel that comes in the lease price. So we are eliminating maintenance on some of the oldest city operating buildings. I say thanks to the man, uh, Madam Manager. Let's be bold, let's make the decision put City Hall in the Burns building, and then we can move on to solve other issues because we have lots of them in front of us. It's the right decision. Uh, thank, uh, you. thank you, Mr. Bryson. Um, I have Mr. Kelly, and did I see your hand go up? And then Mr. Smith, and then um, I would ask Madam Mayor to make a motion, if that's all right with you. Mr. Kelly. Thank you. 
I, I think I feel a little bit along, I guess I have a, maybe a couple comments and then maybe I'll end with a question. All right. So I, I think I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad that Mr. Bryson spoke because I also appreciate it um, when, when, when government can, can act fast, can act boldly, and can uh, make good decisions. I, I also want to echo what, um, what, what Ms. hughes Gandhi said about us wanting to be a good employer. I think a part of that is parking, and then maybe I, I might sound like a broken record because I feel like a lot of my questions and a lot of my comments have been around parking. I think we want to make it not only as uh, as as easy as we can for our own employees to to get to work, but in whatever arrangement that we end up doing. But we also uh, want to keep in mind, and I know from my conversations I've had with uh, with you, Manager Kester, that we are keep in mind that it's not just employees who will need to access the. City Hall, it will also be citizens uh, who need services and who want to attend meetings. I, in, is there a question? Th th there is a request. Thank you. There is a question. So, yeah, I had, those are my two comments, and now my question. Thank you. Because um, we, we're talking a bit about the, the impetus of this, possibly slowing it down um, going forward, backwards. So, my question is uh, there, there is some urgency, at least, in making this decision about where we move our city employees correct because our lease with the marine view ends in july so it, it, is it to my understanding and correct me if i'm wrong that the part of the urgency for this is that we do have a, a lease that will be terminating and that we also have unfit conditions um, next door madam manager thank you mr kelly and you are correct. Our lease expires with Marine View in July. We would enter into a month to month uh, lease with them unless the body gave me reason to believe it would be long enough that we should negotiate something with a longer tenure and a better rate. Um, and you are also correct that in any way we have, we, we hope to evacuate or leave that space within the next few weeks to allow construction to uh, continue. So that situation is a little bit more um, pressing. Thank you, Madam Manager. Uh, Mr. Smith and then Madam Mayor will. Thank you, Madam questions. Deputy Mayor. I just wanted to make another comment on the guidance. Um, I, I think, you know, I, I'm sure you would get this. I, I, I like that we talk about how it aligns with CBG goal, assembly priorities and goals. I do just also want to make sure that we're looking at and requesting, you know, other benefits to the community. For instance, if we only use the goals, I mean, those are usually like mm -hmm. relatively short term. Some are, some will be longer, but we've kind of kept the list a little shorter. For instance, there's just nothing that mentions seniors on in the assembly goals. So I just don't want possible uses like that to be not as fully considered just if we're just buying, if I just want to be flexible and that it's not, you know, it's not just assembly goals and priorities that should should be kind of, you know, used to rank these these requests. So thank you, Mr. Little, Smith. Like, other benefits of the community would be another comment. Mm, so, Madam Manager, you've got that. Yes, thank you. I guess I, I will add that it is not the intention of staff to eliminate anything before the Public Works and Facility Committee sees it, but certainly when we give you an analysis of the options, we will be using this guidance as our compass. And I think perhaps, Ms. Oh, go ahead, Mr. Smith. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And that's that's kind of why I'm maybe requesting that we, you know, also, again, I'm sure you would do that. I just want to get it out there. But other other benefits of the community or just benefits of the community, because, again, I, I don't think that our goals are not all encompassing on, you know, the benefits of the community that we're trying to consider. There were like things we wanted to focus on in the next year. So thank you, Mr. Smith and Mr. Scandi. Madam Mayor has a motion, if that's all right with you. I, I know you had your hand up, but we have been at this for more than an hour. Absolutely. This was a clarification on what Mr. Smith said and Ms. Manager's uh, reply, if you don't mind it, two seconds. Uh, I read this as discuss and amend as appropriate. So, Mr. Smith, I'm taking that as you amending these, and then we will use that to make that decision. Is that correct? Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Madam Mayor. Uh, thank you. 
do number one now, right? <laughs> yes, madam. I, I apologize I, for my that's all right. instructions. Um, so we'll just go to the first one first. Um, I move that we direct staff to proceed with negotiations on leasing the Burns building. And do you ask for unanimous consent? Always. Are there any objections? Ms. Wall. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this is tough for me. Um, I'm definitely okay with us moving forward with the discussion about what to potentially do with Floyd Drain and um, Marie Drake. And I think Marie Drake is off the table for me, given what we've heard about parking. I'm not sure we've built our case yet to the community to take Floyd Dryden off the table. Um, maybe it's a matter of how we're sharing the numbers of what it would cost to turn Floyd Dryden into something that um, that will meet our workforce's needs. Uh, but but when I, I know that we would much rather have a city hall in downtown, but if we don't have a good option that's cost effective, then I think we need to show the community a little, bring them a little further along um, before signing a lease. So I'll object for now. Uh, thank you, Ms. Wall. Mr. Bryson. I'm going to support the motion and uh, I'm going to support it because um, we talked and I believe in a recent meeting we talked about that there were no facilities in the valley that could support Floyd Dryden being City Hall. There's not food around there. There's not stores around there. It's in the middle of residential section. It makes a horrible location for City Hall. It's not by anything. It's in, just shoved in the back of the valley. Um, and so we had a discussion, and I thought the answer that we came up from the discussion is Floyd Dryden makes a horrible location for the valley. Anything that we take out of downtown, if the city comes out of downtown, it will only be filled, backfilled by tourism or tourism activities. That makes it that much more critical that CBJ uh, City Hall is located downtown only to push back on the tourism, because if, some, if City Hall leaves, vacates spaces, that's the industry that's growing right now, and that's what we would see. So I would strongly advocate for keeping City Hall downtown and uh, moving forward on the Burns building, uh, because I think we've asked the question about, could Floyd Dryden be a City Hall? And I'm, I'm pretty certain we've come back with the answer, no. Thank you, Mr. Thank Bryson. Uh, Madam Mayor. Uh, thank you, um, and thank you for the support, uh, Mr. Bryson. Um, one of the other reasons that I think that we should not be considering Floyd Dryden um, as City Hall, besides it's just in the valley. I know people say, well, it's in the valley, it's close to me. I get that, but it's like Mr. Bryson said, it's not close to anything else, is we have a very viable entity that's interested in Floyd Dryden, and they're going to defray the cost, and we all are hesitant to accept the city manager's increase in mill rate, but we know that it came at a cost because we have these three buildings. So anything that can help us get rid of that cost means that we can uh, fight to get that mill rate down. So that's my one of the reasons I'm supporting this. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Mr. Kelly. Thank you. I, I will also speak in support of this motion for a lot of the reasons that Mr. Bryson covered uh, that they're that basically Floyd Dryden is not in any sort of economic, um, it's not economically viable, I believe. Uh, I believe also, I find myself um, convinced that even though we haven't seen an estimate, it, it seems logical to me that the price would be comparable to, to renovating um, or, or at least making adjustments to Marie Drake for office space. Uh, it might be helpful if the public were able to look at those numbers. So maybe that's something that estimates is something that we can still uh, get, but it seems logical to me that we would actually be saving uh, money um, by not having to renovate the um, Floyd Dryden. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kelly, Ms. Atkinson. Uh, I just an objection for the purpose of the question. I have already mentioned that I have concerns about the Burns building with it being state space and um, but this is not the final decision on that so um, that's not why I'm objecting. My main question is do we have any idea uh, Manager Kester how long you estimate these negotiations might take? Um, Madam Manager, good question. I, I don't have a good response to that. I'm sure that Ms. Bricker could 
respond probably more quickly than our process because I do acknowledge that they are a lot of moving pieces. So, you know, part of this is the chicken and egg of like basing, you know, the numbers that I'm sending and that I'm giving to you off of like experience and hypotheticals because we haven't taken those negotiations to that next step. So I think the negotiations will take as long as um, we uh, want them to and certainly um, some certainty in moving forward with Marie Drake and Floyd Dryden, I would expect to be uh, you know, at least some vision of that, you know, has to be part of your decision making process just because you're the ultimate decision makers. And so, again, there's a lot of chicken and egg in this, which is, um, it, which is what makes it difficult. Uh, thank you. That, that helps. I, since we're just authorizing negotiations to begin and they might take a while, I will remove my objection. Um, thank you, Ms. Atkinson. Are there additional comments? Ms. Uskandis. Thanks, Madam Chair. Just a real quick comment. Um, I, I appreciate Ms. Wall's concerns. You know, I hate that we're talking about this at all, and I think part of that is it's easy, or I'll say just for myself, I won't speak for all of us, that, you know, hindsight being 2020, you know, I wish that we had done a better job of bringing the community along. I wish that we weren't in this position where we're looking at leasing space. Uh, we're in a new position where we're looking at extra buildings, but I do think it's really important for us to care for that piece of really bringing the community along in this process. For instance, hearing that there's not, you know, food or whatever around it. We, people work all over a community. They work in Lemon Creek. They work elsewhere where that's, that's not a concern. So we don't want to sort of elevate that. I have my own feelings that I believe that City Hall should be downtown. But um, I think let's just continue caring for that sort of, I, I still have a lot of concerns, but I'll remove my objection to move this bit forward. I would just think uh, as you work on those estimates, I hope that we don't put the cart before the horse, I guess. Thank you, Ms. Uskandis. Mr. Smith. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Just briefly, um, I'll support the motion. I appreciate Ms. Wall's idea, question and the reason she's objecting. Um, I agree with Ms. Uskandis on needing to keep, keep the community with us here. Um, for me, you know, Marie Drake obviously doesn't work with parking. Um, I think the, I think the city hall is better downtown. Um, it, we might have some. Anyway, I think it's probably just a better space, um, and especially seeing also in the memo that the cost for Marie Drake or a Floyd Dryden renovation would be similar to Marie Drake and over ten million dollars. So, um, I'll be supporting the motion. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I'll comment and then we'll call the question. Um, I, I think that I I. Uh, I take very seriously the concerns about making sure we bring the community along. And um, we remember we are following a, a, an incredibly controversial school board process. And so there's been a lot of uproar and um, in the community. And so we're following that and then making decisions that we feel that we have to make. And in a lot of ways, um, the Burns building is a great opportunity that we didn't have a year ago. It wasn't there a year ago. And so um, in some ways to me, I feel that that is being very responsive to the community's votes on building a new city hall. But I have heard from other constituents who don't think that is the case. So I, I look forward to that process. I think if we are negotiating, that is also an opportunity to involve and engage the community. Um, Madam Clerk, will you please call roll? Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. So for the mayor's motion to recommend um, recommendation number one on the memo, page three, um, to authorize staff to proceed with negotiations on leasing the Burns building. Mayor Weldon. Yes. Mr. Bryson. Yes. Ms. Hughes-Candies. Yes. Mr. Smith. Yes. Ms. Wall. No. Well, uh, you know. Yes. Mr. Kelly. Yes. Ms. Adkison. Yes. And Ms. Hale. Yes. Motion carries eight to one. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Madam Mayor, do you have a second motion? Certainly. 
I move that we direct staff to design a public process soliciting proposed uses from organizations for Marie Drake and Floyd Dryden with the potential guidelines with the top one being amended as support assembly priorities, goals, or other community benefits. Um, and with the understanding that Clinton Ida has already proposed a use for a portion of Floyd Dryden, so they wouldn't, they've already given us their solicitation and asked for unanimous consent. Are there any objections? Mr. Smith. Just for a question, thank you. I'm again kind of concerned about timeline. Should I, um, does, does this motion encapsulate the timeline that you have here or? Madam Mayor. I didn't touch the timeline because I figured we were still going to discuss that a little bit. Oh. Okay. Assuming as we are, um, want a slightly longer one to get requests from the community. But Madam I'll Mayor, did you feel that we were going to discuss that right now? Um, yes, I think the staff got direction that our, we th thought the timeline was a little aggressive. So I'm hoping they come back with a second one, but maybe they didn't get that direction and we need to give that to them. <laughs> uh, Miss Madam Manager, do you feel you got that dirt? I don't feel we gave you that direction. I, I would ask for that clarifying question at some point before this topic was closed. Uh, so you let me know. I have a couple of clarifi clarifying questions. So you let me know when that would be a good time. So, Madam Deputy Mayor, if you uh, can humor me, can we do this motion? Take a little tiny recess to look at the calendar and then come back with another timeline. We will do this motion and we will take a 10 minute recess because I think we deserve it by now. Um, and then we will come back to the timeline. Ms. Uskandis, did you have? Thank you, response? Madam Chair. I think that satisfies my concerns because without splitting it, I would either be a yes or a no. And with these priorities, I can be a yes. Are, are, do we have any objections to the Madam Mayor's motion? Uh, seeing no objection, that motion passes. It is 721. We will be back at 731 to address the timeline. <clears throat>
Madam Clerk, are we ready? No, I know. Madam Clerk, are we ready? We are. We will bring this meeting back to order at 7.32. We actually took 11 minutes, so my apologies. Um, we are next going to address the um, the timing issue, and I don't know, Madam Mayor, did you want to lead that? And then no, I, I wanted Mr. Smith to lead that because he talked to the city manager, so okay, Mr. or all she can Smith. talk to it. <laughs> uh, Mr. Smith, thank you. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. My uh, looking over the calendar and just I guess my concern is that I think um, having requiring the, the community organizations to submit the requests in the next two weeks is just a little too aggressive of a timeline and that's kind of what the um, if it was held at the 5.6 uh, the May 6th PWFC that's what it would require. Um, my hope is that we would actually review the submissions from the organizations at the June 3rd committee of the whole. So it's kind of striking the second bullet and just having submissions reviewed at this at June 30 June 3rd committee of the whole um, ma my motion. madam manager oh, yeah let's ask madam manager before we jump into voting on that how that works um, uh, you and I both know that the committee of the whole schedule is very full but or do we call a special public works committee meeting yeah, I, I uh, appreciate that the cow schedule is very full. As evidenced by our agenda this evening, I also appreciate that the whole body is very interested in this topic. Um, the intention of working through PWFC would be to get some feedback through that process. So, um, you know, you, you get some proposals, we need more information, what about this, what about that? So I just see that happening at the cow level, which might may push things out a little bit later, or it may not, depending on, on how much feedback um, is needed. Um, and, and we as staff can certainly try to anticipate those questions and, and work to give you guys the most information possible at that meeting. Uh, thank you, Madam Ma Manager. I know I kind of did that out of order. Um, maybe we'll return to the motion and then we'll say, are there any objections, even if it's only for purposes of a question, Mr. Bryson? Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Manager. Uh, Mayor, um, I was going to uh, offer up that public works and facilities on uh, June 3rd. Uh, we could handle it at the public works and facilities level, do some of those initial questions to make sure that all the information is there and then uh, pass it on for the following cow if that was uh, more amenable to the group. Madam Manager, would that, that would push us back. Correct, that just guarantees that we're pushed back. Um, probably gonna happen anyway and um, one half doesn't the other. I'm doing this kind of out of order. So would you object for purposes of a question just back on track, Madam Mayor? Sure, I'll object for purposes of a question because I actually have a question. Oh, good. Um, the other thing that we could potentially do is uh, just have a special PWFC later in the month of May. Um, so that would give, you know, if we did it uh, like on the 20th is a Monday, that would give people quite a, almost a month. I'm looking at um, I see a shaking of heads. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so but, Mr. Oh, go ahead. Madam Mayor. But because I see if we do it at the cow on 6-3, I mean at the PWFC at 6-3, then we have at least two more cows. I, I don't know. I'll, I'll go with the body on this one. Um, but thank you, Mr. Smith. Are you interested in modifying your motion at all? I'm open to options, yes. <laughs> uh, Mr. Bryson. Uh, Madam Deputy uh, Mayor, I'll be more than happy to chair uh, an additional public works meetings on May 20th. Monday, May 20th, absolutely. Um, thank you, Mr. Smith. If you're interested in modifying your motion, now would be a good time to do it. Sure. Um, I'm, I guess I just now changed the second bullet point to I'm just going to look at the members who are on PWC to make sure they actually can do it and it's going to work with their schedule. But um, making, changing the second bullet point to um, a May 20, 2024 PWFC to review the submissions. And that would be a special PWFC. Are there any objections? Objection. Uh, 
Ms. Uskandis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I would object to that. I was starting to think that it doesn't, um, you know, if we kicked from 415 to the public works on June 3rd and then you add, you know, the 715 cow and the cow after that, I thought, oh, yeah, okay, that's getting closer to what, you know, I, I don't think I would need to object to that. Um, adding a special is usually what we do when we're trying to rush something or we need to get something in and on a timeline. So like I have already stated that this timeline gave me cause for concern. So even though it's wiggling things around a little bit, um, adding a, an extra meeting to, to take a look at this would not be something I would, uh, I would be in support of. And I'll really quickly just well, maybe I'll just leave it on that because this is an amendment to motion or should I speak to my objection to the whole motion? I, I actually asked Mr. Smith to, to make, redo it, redo the motion. So it is not an amendment. Sorry okay. About that. I'm really like out of order here, but you're doing great. You guys can fire me if you want. <laughs> you're doing wonderfully. <laughs> I'll just then add on uh, just my concerns. I already spoke to a little bit. I very much understand that we're getting feedback from the public and interest, and I think it is good and important to um, provide a funnel. I'm extremely excited about uh, some of the potential for partnering with, you know, uh, community partners to work on things like childcare. So I don't want to slow things down so much that we're not taking advantage of that. But I just, for context, want to say, uh, someone already mentioned earlier, this comes at the end of a really crazy rushed, very contentious school board process. So, and, uh, and we got a preview at our first budget Saturday that we're also somewhere and they're gonna have to have a big community discussion about the hospital. So there are a lot of things in play that the community they're, like I said, consequential decisions, and that doesn't mean we stop making decisions. It just means if we had had the ballot measure pass, we wouldn't be saying, what three things can we get done as fast as possible? Although I like it when we get things done as fast as possible. Um, so I don't think that this is something that we need to bump our other priorities out of the way to figure out what we do with these buildings right away. Thank you, Mrs. Gandhi's Madam Mayor. I'll object for purposes of amendment, and hopefully this will take uh, Ms. Hughes-Gandy's in, uh, uh, concerns in mind. So just strike the five, the May 6, 24 PWC, um, move it to the 6.324 PWFC, and then just move everything down, and then the next cow after 7.15 is 8.5, if I check my calendar correctly, but I'll... Uh, always defer to Madam Clerk. <laughs> so, so we would have 4:15 the cow, 6.6 June 3rd a PWFC, uh, 7:15 a Committee of the Whole, and then 8:15 as needed uh, uh, Committee of the Whole, and then it would go to the assembly. 8:5. 8:5. Right? I'm sorry. Yeah. Are there any objections to Madam Mayor's obje uh, amendment? I see. Uh, uh, going once. Seeing no objections, that amendment passes. Now we, we, we will return to the original motion. Uh, Mr. Kelly. I did just object for the purposes of a question. So at this point, we would be hearing at the cow in July at the full assembly level in August. And then it would probably have to be, uh, would it be done as an ordinance or a resolution? How, how quickly? Cow, cow. The cow would be? Cow in August. Cow in August. Sorry, I have my mic on. So 6, June 3rd would be the PWFC, and then you just move everything down. Okay. So 715 would be a cow, and 85 would be a cow. Okay. Um, so I guess my question is still similar. Uh, when would, these, would this be introduced as an ordinance or a resolution, and how soon? What, what would the timeline for this coming to fruition be? Thank you, Madam Manager. Yeah, I, I'm not really sure. You'll notice that the last bullet point I listed in my timeline that I could get to was review public input and discuss next steps to implement desired uses. And that's because I see that going so many different ways depending on what 
the will of the body is, budget pressures are, and the community uses are. So um, I have a hard time imagining that at that juncture we will be ready to introduce an ordinance, but we may be ready to uh, for certain facilities for certain uses, right? Because there could be some very clear, uh, clear uses. So um, I don't have a great answer to that question. Um, and, and I think that's part of the hesitation that you guys are feeling with that timeline is it's, it's not, it, we can't map that out without knowing some of the variables at, at play. Thank you, Madam Manager. So we will return, uh, do you remove your objection, Mr. Kelly? I do. Thank you, and we will return to the original motion made by Mr. Smith, which I can't even, <laughs> as amended, which I can't even state at this point, and I don't know if you can either, because I asked you to change it in midstream. Can you restate it, Mr. Smith? As amended, it just has changed, it has just pushed the schedule back starting now with the June 3rd PW, PWFC, so, and then altering the rest of it All right. sequentially. Madam Clerk, is that good enough? Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Um, the original motion that I had was to review this at the 6-3 cow, and then that was amended by having a special PWFC on 520. So, as it's been amended by the mayor, yes, that's clear that we will push the schedule back starting with the 6-3. And not have um, that special. And not with a special PWFC. Uh, we, can we have a brief two-minute at ease? We will have a brief two-minute at ease. I'm the one that says it. Uh, uh, what's that? Are there any objections? Seeing none, but this is what we will do with the dates and I am going to return to the agenda and I'm going to say something that I was going to say at the beginning now that we've taken an hour and 45 minutes on the first topic on a very full agenda and it was a really good discussion. So I want to have good and robust discussions because these are all very important topics, but I also would really love to get us out of here. I was hoping by nine. Um, so, uh, um, I don't know what I was thinking. Anyway, let's just keep that in mind. And if we can be as concise as possible and still have a robust conversation, I think it will help everyone. So, Madam Manager, are you ready to move on to the second topic? Uh, or is this Mr. Deputy Manager? Mr. Deputy Manager, please, Gold Weather Shelter. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. I had a very long preamble that I was going to give you on this topic, but in the interest of what you just said, I will skip that and dive right into the memo. Um, although I will note that I think this is an incredibly challenging topic um, with not a lot of good solutions. Um, so you have a memo in your packet, uh, and the f I'll, I'll start uh, briefly with summarizing a little bit about the cold weather shelter. Um, tonight is the last night of the cold weather shelter. Uh, you also received an email uh, update on kind of the status of the Cold Weather Shelter throughout the season from St. Vincent de Paul Executive Director Dave Ringel, um, who's in the audience tonight. And I just want to pull out a key point that he made in that update that St. Vincent's, along with other partner providers, uh, since our last committee of a whole, or since our last regular assembly meeting on the 1st, has really been focused on uh, finding housing uh, options for our most vulnerable cold weather shelter clients, I think with a significant degree of success. On the, on the topic of the CWES, uh, we are planning next year to replicate uh, the model that we used this year. Um, we think uh, it generally went well and generally, not universally, but generally the feedback uh, on that program has been positive. We are planning um, one significant change that we'll, we'll enact this summer, that's a construction project um, that will bring, bring the restrooms and plumbing inside the building, uh, which uh, we think will help uh, pretty significantly with staff safety and with behavioral and substance use management. So that's the cold weather shelter. And then on the topic of the campground, um, since our last meeting, uh, or at our last meeting, you heard we learned of a significant construction project immediately adjacent to the 100 Mill Street site. 
Um, we're concerned about that from a use compatibility perspective. Um, we haven't had time to dive into the details on that, but it seems it seems like that is uh, potentially a challenging impediment. Also to that, um, we uh, received a cost estimate that was much of, far far above uh, what we thought it would would take to move the move the equipment off of the 100 Mill Street site. Um, all of our estimates on that particular project are a wag at this point. Um, we are waiting on a genuine estimate from uh, another contractor. We haven't gotten that yet. Um, I mentioned at the out front, uh, we, we really don't see a lot of good options, any, frankly, for the campground at this point. Um, I have, since our last meeting, also had additional conversations with uh, business owners at the Rock Dump. Um, their concerns are much the same that you heard at our last meeting. Uh, we talked uh, about uh, potential transportation uh, assistance from that group. Um, one of the one of the options that we discussed briefly last time, and that we've driven, we've talked a little bit more about since, is the Little Rock Dump, which is. Um, the Little Rock Dump. It's a little further down Thane Road. It's a smaller uh, uh, jut out into the channel, and the, uh, the I think that it is possible that the Rock Dump business owners or some combination of them could provide transportation services, but it is clear that those services would be very expensive. Um, the memo in the packet goes into some detail about pros and cons on uh, alternative sites. Uh, I, I won't rehash those. We talked about them uh, at our last meeting. I will note that um, the little rock dump option uh, shares the same challenges from an invisibility perspective as the former mill campground site, um, which which doesn't lead uh, us to believe that um, that it would be beneficial from a camper safety perspective. There are other areas that are possible, uh, but not in a short time horizon. Uh, I think I think there's there's more analysis that, that could be done. Um, I, I don't see any other areas that are just resounding successes from a, from an options point of view. So, right now, our recommendation is to uh, continue to coordinate and collaborate with partner organizations. Uh, to connect individuals with housing solutions and to provide wraparound services. Uh, St. Vincent de Paul and the Glory Hall in particular have been active in doing that work over the past couple of weeks. Um, St. Vincent de Paul is currently soliciting and has received a significant number of donations in terms of sleeping bags and food um, to assist potential campers who might not get connected to housing solutions. Uh, we will, I think, regardless, continue to meet with our provider community to explore options and opportunities as they might come up. Um, and uh, dispersed camping, I think, is important to note and have noted in previous memos on this topic. Dispersed camping happen it happens regardless, right? It just simply happens more if we don't have a uh, summer campground in place. And our um, general practice in uh, working through dispersed camping and the challenges that it can present to the community all has to do with impacts. It all has to do with impacts to both the individuals that are camping as well as the uh, typical use of the location of wherever they are camping. And uh, like other communities, when the impacts are low uh, and minimal to uh, everyone involved, including other community uses, we are uh, less likely to take uh, actions and um, and and abate or clean up uh, campgrounds when they occur. Uh, and conversely, when the impacts are high, uh, then we are more likely to take actions to um, uh, return that use to its intended purpose, whatever it is. You have a couple of ordinances uh, in your packet. Uh, and there is a there is a tiny typo in the recommendation on packet page eight. So in the in the italics, uh, it says adoption of ordinance 2024-14 means dispersed camping until such a time that the assembly designates the location by resolution. That should say adoption of ordinance 2024-18. So we'll just just note that for you and for uh, the listeners. Um, 
And uh, so our recommendation is to vote, uh, vote down or table uh, Ordinance 2024-14, which was uh, introduced, and then forward to the Assembly for introduction Ordinance 2024-18, which would um, allow the Assembly to designate a campground by a resolution uh, whenever that opportunity or option presents itself. Mr. Barr, just to clarify, because I've made this mistake when I, this error was pointed out to me, it is the very last uh, paragraph, it's the italicized paragraph at the bottom of page 8 that it should be 2024-18, so not further up in the memo. Thank you. I am looking for discussion and comments. Mr. Kelly. Uh, thank you. I have quite a few questions, but of course, I'll take my turn. Um, you mentioned in your report that uh, you would need uh, some more time to do analysis on, on other potential options. How much time do you think you, you would need, just, just so I can get an idea? Mr. Deputy Manager. Thank you, Madam Mayor. It's a challenging question to answer because any site that we look at will, of course, have a significant amount of public process and a significant amount of opinion that I think the assembly and staff uh, will want to closely consider. So, um, I, I, I don't, I don't see a potential, um, you know, unicorn site uh, on the horizon. So, I, I would. Um, characterize the amount of time necessary in, in months rather than weeks. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Manager, Ms. Atkinson. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, I'm just wondering if we're going to be having dispersed camping in the interim while we look for a more suitable site, is there anything we can do to support staff or emergency services to better serve these dispersed camps? Since I know that's a big part of why we have the centralized campus so that we can get services to the people who are camping. Is there anything we can do to support city staff with the dispersed camping? Mr. Deputy Manager. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, and Ms. Atkinson, we uh, have a meeting on that very topic tomorrow um, to talk about what our, our, our plan of action would be, and I'd be happy to come back uh, to the body if we determine that additional supports are needed. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Wall and then Mr. Kelly. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Um, I think this is a question for the attorney. Um, if the assembly votes down um, ordinance 2024-14 um, and passes 2024-18. Um, does that preclude us from looking at 100 Mill Street any time in the near future? Mr. Attorney. Yeah, uh, thank you, Ms. Wall. So the short answer is no. So I believe, I don't know what page it is on your packet, but it's section four of the ordinance of, of the page 13. So lines three through five-ish. Mm -hmm. So it designates the campground for 2024 and identifies it as dispersed camping. However, the language specifically allows the assembly to designate another location, uh, whether it's 100 Mill Street or somewhere else, if you choose, that's the best interest of the community in a month or uh, in three months. Mr. Bryson. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Kelly and then Mr. Bryson, sorry about that. Uh, thank you. Um, I guess this is a general question, I'm not sure who's best suited to answer, but if we do close the current campground that we are using now, what is to stop people from using it anyway? Uh, Mr. Deputy Manager. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, it's private property. Uh, it's property that is owned and managed currently by uh, uh, AELMP through, um, through a subsidiary company. And uh, it would be up to the private property owner to inf enforce on that property. Uh, Mr. Bryson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Oh, man, I wonder. Um, so we keep using the word campground. And when I think of campground, I think of the Mendenhall campground where I've camped with my family or the Auk Rec campground. Those are campgrounds they, for recreating. 
we're not talking about creating a campground for recreation. We're talking about building a homeless neighborhood or an unsheltered population neighborhood. We say the word campground, it makes it a little bit easier. The campground here, the camp, where, where can we put a campground? We're not really talking about where we're gonna put a campground for recreating. We're talking about where we're gonna put a neighborhood of unhoused individuals in the community. Mr. Bryson. Yes, madam. Um, we are talking about dispersed camping right now. We're not talking about a campground. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Um, Mr. Bryson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. So um, we're saying uh, not have a campground for dispersed camping, but at the same time, we're not really talking about like camping as a recreation activity. We're talking about where they're going to live. And whenever we say camping, it's, it, to me, it almost has like a, uh, like a, a fun recreating component to it. I've gone camping with my family, something we did as a fun activity. We're talking about where we can have people live. And so that's why I was wanting to take the, whether we talk about dispersed camping or campgrounds, I think it's a, a misnomer on our part because we're talking about where are we gonna allow unsheltered individuals to live in the community or are we gonna allow unsheltered individuals to create a neighborhood on a piece of property that we designate? To me, that is a more accurate depiction of what we're trying to accomplish here, whether talking about if, if somebody came into town and didn't know any of the politics or the background, they said, ooh, a campground, I could, I could camp all summer? Like, as a fun thing that they would be able to, to live here. They would not be able to go, a, a visitor could not come and camp at what we're referring to as a campground right now. So I thought if maybe we stated what we're really trying to accomplish, it would, would maybe help us get there faster. Thank you, that Mr. Bryson, and I apologize. I was just trying to make sure we, were, we stayed on track. I have Ms. Wall, and then I believe I have Mr. Kelly again. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Um, just a clarification on what we are what we need to do tonight, because and we, I feel like probably a lot of us have a lot of things to say, but we don't necessarily have to. All we, in terms of action that's being recommended to us tonight, that would just be introducing a resolution is that correct uh yes is that correct mr mr deputy manager thank you um thank you madam deputy mayor we're our recommendation is to ask uh, for direction to introduce an ordinance um ordinance 2024-18 specifically and upon passage of that ordinance the assembly would be able to designate a campground at some future date by resolution and, and also are we being asked to vote down ordinance 2024-14 mr mr uh, attorney yeah uh, thank you so if the committee chooses to hold Ordinance 2024-14, the 100 Mill Street campground, you could table that one here in committee, so then it wouldn't appear for public hearing at the next meeting. Okay, thank you. Um, I I have uh, Mr. <clears throat> Kelly, and then I have some comments, and then maybe we can go to a motion, unless anyone else has uh, comments. Mr. Kelly. I think I'll save my question for later. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Um, I understand, um, I understand what Mr. Bryson is, is saying about uh, camping versus neighborhood. However, um, I also know that having camped in some dire circumstances, you really are camping because you really aren't living in a house. And so, um, and, and you really are out exposed to the weather. So um, I, I, I guess I will just disagree. And Madam Mayor, I think you have a motion. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. So I move that we table Ordinance 2024-14 and forward to the Assembly for introduction on April 29th, Ordinance 2024-18. Madam Mayor, will you please split that into two motions? Certainly. I move that we table Ordinance 2024-14 and ask for an announced consent. Are there any objections? And Ms. Wall? I'll object. I'm, I, I've... I feel like um, right now our situation around this is 
we're still waiting on some information. I'm definitely still curious what the public has to say. Um, I'm not saying I'm going to vote yes, or but I feel like one more step in the public process isn't a bad idea. Are there further comments or should we call the question? Madam Clerk, will you please call the question? Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. So for the motion to table ordinance 2024-14, Mayor Weldon? Yes. Ms. Atkinson? Yes. Mr. Kelly? Yes. Wallachie Doc? Yes. Ms. Wall? No. Mr. Bryson? Yes. Ms. hughes Candies. Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. And Deputy Mayor Hill? Yes. Motion carries 8 to 1. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Madam Mayor? Oh, thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Um, I move to forward to the Assembly for introduction on April 29th, Ordinance 2024-18. And Madam Deputy Mayor, can I speak to that motion? Yes, please, Madam Mayor. Um, so this in a sense, gives us dispersed camping until at such time we could find another site, which could be Mills, 100 Mill Street at another time. Um, and you have heard me speak against dispersed camping just to the same point that Ms. Agkison pointed out for emergency personnel. But um, I called around the state, that's something you can do, and talked to some other mayors, and I was surprised that they all said, we don't do that because if you put them together in a campground, you tend to have much more illegal activity. So I'm willing to give it a try and see what's happening. And so that's why I'm moving this forward. Are there uh, any objections, Ms. Scandies and then Mr. Kelly? I'll object for the purpose of a, just a brief comment. I, 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 I was okay with doing this mechanism right now because it sounds like there's more info we gotta get and there are some substantial uh, blocks, obstacles right now to doing what we would want to do. But I will just say that um, I, I think it's, as far as illegal activity or not, I view our unhoused population uh, that we owe them every, uh, the same duties that we do our housed population. And I see this as a setback, but I don't think that as far as the city goes, I don't think dispersed camping is um, any kind of solution. So I will be pushing still for us to, to find something and try to overcome those obstacles. But I remove my objection. Thank you, Mrs. Scandies, Mr. Kelly. Thank you. I think um, for a couple reasons, uh, I'd like to object for the purposes of making an amendment to the motion. And I feel this might address a little bit of uh, Ms. Wool's concern about uh, public process and the public being able to continue to, to be involved. But I also think this helps address the urgency of the, of the issue. And my, my amendment to Madam Mayor's motion is that uh, just like we did with uh, when we just got with 2024-14, I, I would move to amend Madam Mayor's motion that we open it also for, for public hearing at that when we introduce the ordinance. You, I think what you're saying is introduce and hold public hearing on the same day. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Wall. Um, I'll object. I, I oh, I'm sorry, just a moment. What, oh, oh I'm sorry. sorry. I'm sorry, Mr. Kelly. Did you want to speak to that? I'm sorry. I am exhausted. It's, uh, no worries. I feel like in the lead up to making my motion, I, I, um, I, I explained my reasoning. Okay, thank you. Ms. Wall. Thank you, Madam um, Deputy Mayor. I, I'll object, I appreciate Mr. Kelly wanting um, public opinion. I was speaking specifically about 100 Mill Street. Um, so I think my, my concerns are, um, you know, about something else. But, you know, I think the last time we did this was because um, staff needed direction to start moving ahead. And that was kind of why we made that exception to have public hearing at the same time as introduction. I think if we get in the habit of that, then um, 
will will get in trouble quickly. Thank you. I withdraw my motion and objection. Um, thank you, Mr. Kelly. Are there further objections to Madam Mayor's motion? So we have no objections at this point then? Um, then that motion passes. Um, and I, we need to take a five minute break. Thank you. So we'll be back.
We'll bring uh, the assembly committee of the whole back to order. I have a Mountain Dew. I'm going to be up all night. <laughs> They, they actually state the caffeine content, and then they say, we're here to help. <laughs> uh, um, the, the next item that we're going to move on to is short-term rentals, and following that, we have um, Telephone Hill, which we hope we will get to. We are not going to address Title 49 uh, work plan uh, tonight, work plan rewrite, rewrite work plan tonight. Um, in the conversation about short-term rentals, we're really just, a uh, Madam Manager is really just looking for some ideas. So let's have that discussion. Um, and if we need to, if it looks like we need to come back later, if we don't have sort of a good sense of what ideas we've got as a body, then we can pick it up again at a future meeting. But um, Madam, uh, yes, Ms. Mr. Smith. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. I just want to um, make a disclosure in that I operate a short-term rental seasonally. Um, I've talked to the attorney. It's not something just due to the general nature of that. I don't need to recuse myself. So, thank, thank you. Thank you for that disclosure. Um, uh, Mr. Smith, um, Madam Manager, uh, given my intro, are you ready? Ah, Mr. Deputy Manager, thank you. That's right. The, the memo is from you. I'm already feeling perkier. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, so you have a memo in your packet. I'll go over this in, in some detail. We last talked about this topic in July uh, of last year. The outcome of that was a free short-term rental registration, uh, an ordinance that enacted a, a free short-term rental registration program. Um, and that is a program we have had in effect since last fall. Uh, short-term rental operators can register uh, online uh, on our website or via a printed form that they can download off our website or get from the sales tax office. It is easy. Um, it is a single page. I uh, adjusted my taxes, and uh, this is not that. Um, we collect on that form business and sales tax information, a very limited amount of information about the rental property itself, as well as contact information for the operator of the short-term rental and, if relevant, the property manager. Um, and, and just as a reminder, I know you all know this, but for the listeners, the short-term rental is defined as a unit that is occupied for less than 30 days um, that does not include hotels, does include B&Bs. Um, we, uh, data-wise, we have just shy of 600 active and intermittent listings. Um, and at any given point in time, about half of those are active. So we, that, that, that does not mean there are always 600 uh, Airbnbs available on the market at any given time. About half of them are active listen listings. Uh, we're still in our first year of data collection, so we don't yet really have a great sense as to whether or not those listings that are inactive will fall off and be replaced with new short-term rentals or if they will be seasonally active. That's something that we're still, we're still uh, learning. Um, and, uh, but generally speaking, uh, this is uh, uh, data that um, uh, I will interrupt for a period of amusement. I just got a text from my wife that says, no, in fact, I did the taxes, not you, which is correct. Um, <laughs> so, so for the record. Uh, and, um, so anyway, back to the topic at hand. Uh, we, um, that number uh, has been growing slowly over time, uh, whether, whether or not they fall off and we get new ones or those short-term rentals are seasonal the number has been has been increasing uh, from a compliance point of view we send out two letters as part of this program the first is uh, a letter saying hey we think you operate a short-term rental based on this listing that we found online uh, you probably don't know we have the short-term rental program uh, where you need to register registration is free here's how you do it um, and then the registration, the second uh, uh, letter is a little bit more like, hey, we didn't get a response. Um, here's what happens if you don't register. Give us a call. We'll help you get registered. Um, we have a 79% compliance rate, and that 79% means that of the short-term rental uh, operators who we think need to be registered based on um, online listings, based on our work with a software vendor that we use called Harmari, uh, Seventy-nine percent of them have engaged with us, and if appropriate, registered through uh, through the online form or paper form. Uh, and uh, and it, I'll note that when uh, when folks 
contact us. Sometimes we learn that registration is not appropriate because they, they stopped doing their short-term rental or they sold their property and like title information hasn't synced up. Some, that, that occurs, it's, it's rare, but every now and then that, that is the case. Um, also on the data front, uh, it's interesting to note that 82% uh, of short-term rental operators, uh, based on our understanding of the Harmari data, operate a, sh a single short-term rental. Um, but when you slice and dice the data a little bit differently and compare it to our registration uh, program, it, it appears, uh, or we, we believe that about half of short-term rental operators live on the parcel that the rental is on, right? So that could mean that they're renting part of their house that they live in. It could also mean that they're renting a tiny home or an accessory dwelling unit that is unattached um, from their house. But about half of short-term rental operators live live on site. I mentioned that specifically because um, I think that I think that might be one of the regulatory options that the body might be interested in, um, but but uh, we'll be looking for clarification on that and other ideas, uh, as the deputy mayor mentioned um, here in a minute. And the remainder of the memo uh, really goes into some detail discussing the um, potential benefits and detriments that short-term rentals uh, uh, themselves uh, have uh, on, on communities as well as common regulatory paths. Uh, when we think about regulation, there, and when, when communities discuss regulation, um, regulation options tend to fall into one of two broad categories. Uh, one category is um, uh, housing related. So uh, that is the, you know, when, when short-term rentals or when housing units are converted into short-term rentals, that you know logically means that those housing units are not available in the community for long-term rentals or for people who are interested in purchasing uh, dwelling units. And and uh, it's my assumption, and based on previous conversations with the assembly, that that is the path that we are interested in uh, talking about as a community. The second uh, regulatory category is mostly centered around um, community well-being sorts of options so uh, communities will talk about uh, noise regulations and parking regulations and health and safety related um, concerns and we have not received a great deal of complaints or objections from the community on that front uh, so that's that's one of the assumptions that i list in the memo is that uh, we, we believe that your primary interest in the community's interest is talking about this from a housing perspective not from a not from a, a noise and health and safety abatement perspective and uh, there's, there's a list of pros and cons about the proliferation, proliferation of short-term rentals uh, at the bottom of 15. I won't dwell on those, but I will note um, that the more specific regulatory options at the end of the memo on page 16 uh, are ones that uh, align or conform with that assumption that we are interested in addressing the housing affordability and accessibility um, concerns that that I think we all we all have. Um, and Madam Deputy Mayor, I'll stop there and um, turn it over. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Manager. Um, uh, I think what we'll do is we'll start with any questions that Mr. Deputy Manager has, and then um, and then we'll maybe just go down the line and get people's opinions. But let's start with questions, Mr. Bryson. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Um, Mr. Barr, in looking at the registered STRs, were any of the registered owners corporations that bought a property with the purpose of short-term rentaling and then a related question are any of the short-term rentals do they have any uh, ownership with addresses that are not inside of Juno so I'm trying to get at how many short-term rentals were registered that were not owned by Junoites but owned by outside entities or corporations mr. deputy manager thank you deputy mayor I don't have that off the top of my head although uh, I may be getting some lifelines as as the night goes on, and I am noting those questions. Um, we we I'm getting those lifelines very quickly. Um, so there are addresses outside of Juno. Uh, we don't believe there are any big corporations. 
Uh, thank you. And I think what you're saying is you'll, you'll give us some feedback on numbers. Um, Ms. Wall and then Madam Mayor. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. That was, that was one of my questions. Definitely interested in how many, how many of these are owned by outside um, people because that's definitely something I've heard a lot of complaints about or worries about. Um, so I'll move on to my next question, which is, did you see a impact of the letters that you wrote? You know, we had kind of maybe an assumption that there were a bunch of people out there who had signed up one time for Iron Man and this was going to kind of help them get off the site when they realized they were out of compliance, they didn't want to register. Do you have any intel on whether um, those letters are working to both attract people, you know, get people registered or have people take their houses off the site? Uh, Mr. Deputy Manager. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, I don't have specific information about that. I guess that my, my general answer would be, since we see that overall number continuing to slowly tick up, maybe the rate of growth has slowed. Um, it, does, it does appear to be slower than in past years when we saw more significant leaps in that, in that total number. Uh, thank you for that, uh, uh, Madam Mayor, and then Ms. Hughes-Gandys. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. And this is a question for any of you. Um, if you're looking at rental unit, let's just say 15 apartments or something like that, how difficult would it be for staff if we came up with something that said, you know, four can be short-term rentals, the rest have to be long-term rentals? Is that something that we could track, enforce? I don't know if that's Mr. Deputy Manager or Mr. Attorney. Yeah, Deputy Mayor, I can try that one. Um, I think it would be, uh, I think any regulatory options that you as a body are interested in exploring, we will certainly analyze and come back to you with what we think that will take um, from a staff perspective. Um, I think from a multifamily dwelling unit perspective, um, if you envisioned a regulation um, that limited the total amount of um, or the percentage uh, of, of those units in any multifamily dwelling unit that could be short-term rentals, um, it's probably not outside the realm of staff, uh, staff work. Uh, we don't have, uh, unfortunately, a great deal of multifamily dwelling units in Juneau, so it's just my, my spitball at it. We don't have a great what? We don't have a huge number of multifamily dwelling units in Juneau. Um, Ms. Uskandis. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think uh, it sounded like maybe uh, I had the same question as Mr. Bryson, and it sounds like not a ton. You, there are some out of town addresses, but maybe we'll get more information on that. So, I, and I'm curious about how that all overlap with my other question, which is of the, it looks like 18% of operators who operate multiple short-term rentals, and maybe I'm just not getting it in, in the data you provided, but do we have a sense of if an operator is in that 18%, is it easy for you to tease out that Alicia is doing five and Ella is doing 20? Um, <laughs> Ella. Uh, <laughs> thanks. And because and, I would be also interested is if we have 18% that are operating multiple, how many of those are out of state versus in state or in town? Uh, Mr. Deputy Manager. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. We can definitely tease out of, um, and we get data from Hermari on this, how many short-term rentals um, any given operator is operating, right? So I, I can tell you that, um, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but uh, you know we have percentages of how many short-term rental operators operate two or three or four or five or more. Those are the categories. and. Uh, we, uh, assuming those individuals are registered, it would be easy enough for us to cross-reference, cross -reference, uh, you know, look at our registration program data and see uh, how many of the big ones are 
head out of out of Juno addresses as an example. So so long winded answer, yes. Those numbers. We have Madam Mayor, and then we have Mr. Kelly and Mahalke Doc. Are you fine? You're you're doing fine there. Okay, good. Madam Mayor, and then Mr. Kelly. Uh, this is probably a question for the attorney. Um, I see where Mr. Bryson and Ms. Hughes Scannies are going with this, but I don't know if we can regulate something that you have to be a local unless you do an owner occupied. Help me with that one, Mr. Attorney. Yeah, no, thank you. So. I don't remember exactly what circuit, federal circuit court this went to, but there was a federal lawsuit in Louisiana. Uh, yeah, I won't speculate because I don't recall the details. That did find, we can't just say it has to be owner occupied. We have to say owner or manager occupied. That way, uh, if there's a, let's say a business that owns that piece of property, they can have an on-site manager that lives there instead. That's lawful, but otherwise we're discriminating against non residents which is illegal. Uh, thank you. Uh, good question, Mr. Kelly. Thank you. I guess I also had a, que a question for the attorney and it was about how, how we would regulate things. Like if there were certain behavior that, um, that, that we wanted I, actually, I think that the mayor kind of asked my question in, in a little bit of a different way. I, I had kind of a different behavior that I wanted to regulate, but it would also require the owner to occupy it. So if we can't do that, then actually that makes my question moot. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Are there further questions? <clears throat> what I'd like to do then is just kind of go down the line first. Uh, asking assembly members to give us a read on their appetite for regulating STRs. That's it. First question, Mr. Bryson. Um, every ounce of difficulty that we add to STRs only encourages more cruise ship visitation. STRs are a direct competition to cruise. We want to invite the people to come to Juno and, and do that kind of vacationing because we're trying to push back against the cruise industry. Limiting STRs, we've just asked for uh, daily caps. That's how we're pushing back against cruise visitation as we we're trying to limit cruise visitation to then limit independent traveler uh, through STR regulation or make it more difficult, sends a message that we're not excited about people coming to visit Juno if we want to penalize crews. Well, not, I don't, all right, I won't go too far into that. So is but, that a no? Um, I don't, uh, I would want to work with a group to come up with uh, something that was comfortable for everybody, of course, but I wanted that part to be uh, very uh, real in our thought process that while not everybody is in favor of short-term rentals, they do serve a purpose in the community and they do provide economic activity. Thank you. Ms. Uskandis. Thank you, uh, Ms. Hale. I'll uh, start my uh, comment by saying um, in June 5th of last year, we had a meeting about short-term rentals and we had a memo that was very similar to the one we have in front of us if you wanna go back and reference it. And at that time, staff wanted to know uh, what our appetite was for regulation uh, and what considerations we should take into it and what levels of regulation we might be interested in and uh, to discuss possible regs and approaches. And we had a couple of different Alaskan cities that, or one not Alaskan and an Alaskan city as an example. So I, I said earlier that I would flip that around and say the speed of government I actually think in this case we're going way too slow because at that time the majority of the assembly said we have desire to regulate this so all of that is a precursor to say yes I am interested in exploring regulations um, I've been kind of bothering staff ever since then to say where's our slate of regulations and Mr. Barr can tell you that <laughs> we talk about it all the time so I I am very interested in regulating these and obviously it's a complex issue so it's uh well we'll have to get into it but I 
I would go back to that the those meeting minutes and I would say everything I ask for then is I'm still interested in hearing about and as far as public process and timeline no 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 we're not doing we're that. behind okay we're just doing the first question and we're trying to be concise Ms. Wall well, I, had to say that. I, I am I am interested in regulation I will say to Mr. Bryson's point um you know, regulation can be proactive. You know, sometimes we regulate things that are we're behind on and we're trying to kind of bottle up what was started. I don't, you know, when I look at the numbers that were just presented, I'm more worried that this continues to grow than the level that we're at right now. And so maybe if we think about regulating as, and I, I may, others may disagree with me, but, um, you know, this may be an opportunity to get ahead of the curve. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Wall. Uh, well, Holland Kadak. I would say yes for uh, reasons that the, my former two assembly members, ladies, just spoke to. Thank you. Thank you for your brevity. Uh, uh, Ms. Atkinson. Uh, thank you. I want to echo exactly what uh, Ms. Wall just said. I think that even if we decide that uh, we're not interested in tamping down on this industry and that the numbers aren't concerning yet. There's no reason to leave an industry unregulated when we can get ahead of it and make sure that it's growing in a way that we want to see it grow. Thank you. So that's a yes. Uh, Mr. Kelly. I would say yes as well. Um, I'll probably expound a little bit more uh, when we talk about the tools. Uh, basically, um, there are certain behaviors I, I would I would like to encourage uh, without um, tapping down on the economy. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Smith. Yes, I have an appetite to regulate SDRs. Oh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I wish that I'd be that short. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> so this is a tough one for me. Um, I hear Mr. Bryson about the independent travelers um, and the other thing that we haven't even talked about but is cost of living of housing. So having a short term rental attached to your house in some way, shape or form, maybe how you afford your house. But the statistics that I find the most troubling is half of STR operators live on site. That means the other half does not and they're using up housing. So I guess it's a long way of saying I'd be interested in looking at some of the sidelines we put on this, but at the same time, we have to remember that um, there are reasons to have STRs. Sorry, I wasn't as short as I could have been, but that's it. That was very good. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I am also uh, a yes that I'm interested, and it's simply because of uh, our housing shortage, and we have a lot of houses and apartments that have been converted to short-term rentals, and that means people can't live in those that actually live here and work here. Um, I, I do, I, I didn't read the minutes, um, Ms. Uskandis, but I also remember that we said a first step is to uh, register short-term rentals, and so we've done that, and we've got not quite a year under our belt. Now, I would like to move on to uh, preferred regulatory tools and information needs and public process and timeline. And let's just kind of talk about that. Madam Mayor. I think a lot of this is some of the questions that I asked the attorney is what can we do legally would be my question. Um, I mean, can we do owner operator, manager operator? Can we look at an apartment building, say only four, can you be short term? Is there a way to do that? So that'd be my thing is what can we do? Um, legally and we're really not looking for answers today we're really just looking for questions and comments so I, that will be noted um, I'm going to go to Mr. Smith and then Ms. Hughes Gandys thank you Madam Deputy Mayor um, you know I guess I, I won't talk too much about just what having a being able to use a short-term rental has done for me but it has it has really allowed some like economic growth and, and my ability to save money to pay for maintenance on my house, which would have been difficult to cover if I was just renting it out, um, you know, at long term. So, um, and I, you know, due to the seasonal nature of Juno, I think we have some, there's some needs for the, um, and some benefit for it. I guess some things I'm interested in, um, I've I asked Mr. Deputy Mayor, if, you know, if, if we, there's a way to limit so that people can't have multiple short-term rentals um, or multiple properties maybe used as short-term rentals. Um, I'm the on-site piece. I guess I just want to. One thing I kind of want to be cautious of is 
that, and I guess maybe I'm, I may be leaning towards a different style of regulation, but just on site means sometimes those are just people who maybe have more money and can afford to, you know, buy a duplex and rent one side out or buy a large house and, you know, convert a basement or have a large basement. Whereas some people, you know, mine, I, I couldn't rent out my whole place and, and still live on and still live on site at the same time. So um, just wanted to kind of be cautious of, of or j just kind of be aware of that. Um, so I've kind of wondered more about like, should we, can you, should we limit the number of days they can be used as a short term rental? Um, another thing I think that maybe would come all along with this or I'd like to see is just that they would require that the short term rental, any short term rental platform operating in, in Juno, you know, collects and remits appropriate bed, bed and property, um, hotel bed tax and sales tax. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Smith. We're rather than jump to Ms. Uscandy's, I apologize. We're going to just going to go down the line, Mr. Kelly. Thank you. Um, what I, the kind of behavior I was alluding to earlier that I would uh, like to encourage to see. Um, so this whole thing stems from a housing issue and what I would like, my, my parents up in Anchorage, they, they also have a short-term rental, they're retired, um, and that allows them to age in place. Uh, what I would like to see are tools that we could use that would encourage that sort of behavior, to encourage, um, to make it easier for people who, who live someplace to already be able to, to continue to age in place and be able to run a short-term rental out of their house. So if there's some sort of regulatory uh, tool that we could use, um, I guess it's been, we can't use um, somebody living on site, but, but perhaps um, maybe if they're a primary owner, they, they might charge a reduced or perhaps not even have to pay a fee. Um, so those are the, that's kind of where I'm going at this point. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Ms. Atkinson. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. I'll try to be brief. Uh, just in terms of preferred regulatory tools, I have concerns about the economic requirements for the uh, reasons that the mayor mentioned, which is that we want to, the, the kind of short-term rental that makes a lot of sense for our housing issue is make people who are subsidizing their mortgages or something along those lines. And I feel like economic requirements like fee-based registration would unfairly impact people like that versus people who are you know, making a business out of it. And so I, I, I would be more interested in looking at things like geographic limits or time and use-based requirements for those reasons. Um, and as, for, as far as timeline goes, I, I think that public process is much more important than, I guess, um, flooring it, if uh, Ms. Huskandius doesn't kill me for saying that. Um, I really think that this is something that uh, we want to be sure in the future doesn't get out of hand, but I don't know that it's at a crisis point where we need to really act super hastily. Thank you, Ms. Atkinson. Uh, well, hold it back. Yeah, I think there's uh, a number of, you know, we, we looked at, what was it, two different um, examples, and I think there's more to be pulled from, especially um, given Hawaii's innovation on, on what this could look like. And so uh, for me, I'd like to, to pull a few additional examples of, of different communities. I know Maui has a really uh, innovative approach that they recently came out with. And so just looking at those and kind of doing a comparison to what, what also applies. They're, they're very remote. They're also heavily influenced by tourists and by um, Airbnbs and what have you. So it just seems like a natural fit in terms of looking at an example. Thank you, Wahalga Doc. Um, Ms. Wall. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Um, I my com my interest is with process here. I worry about this group spending a lot of time debating the pros and cons of regulation and then coming to a final ordinance and the people who don't want to regulate or the people most impacted by the regulations that we choose are going to show up and be in opposition. And I think, that, you know, that's part of what we do. But I think in this case where we're dealing with something very complex, there's another alternative, which is that we say we're going to regulate short term rentals. We assign a working group or a task force or something. It can be light. And we ask the community 
to come up to, with the solutions themselves. I think that that has, sh in my four years on the assembly, that's when we've been most successful is when we are um, asking the community to weigh the pros and cons before we all come to a conclusion. Thanks. Not that I don't want to have those conversations with you all. You all are smart, and I'm sure we'd come up with a good solution, but I think there could be some an alternative. Thank you, Ms. Wall. Ms. Hughes-Gandys, excellent suggestion. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was just going to say, as in terms of getting ahead of this or uh, stopping it where it is, the reason I'm harping on this seven months ago, asking for regs, or asking for a slate of options and asking for examples is we're not ahead of this. It's too late if you wanted to get ahead of this. Um, so we can throw that out the window. Uh, I'm never going to speak against bringing the community along. Obviously, that's what good public process looks like. Um, in terms of information I need and the questions I need answered, again, not to harp on our wonderful staff, but we asked a lot of really specific questions and data needs then. So probably a lot of mine would be the same. Uh, and I don't have the, you know, YouTube in front of me. Um, but I say that only because it was earlier in the evening. And so we had talked, you know, I probably have, I don't want to forget those detailed questions. I can reference those and, and share them with staff. But um, I think I'm interested in looking at what it looks like to be one and done. So not being able to operate multiple, again, within the bounds of the law, um, owner or uh, manager occupied only. Um, and I, I, I'm just, yeah, I'll just say that, yes, it's important to bring the public along. But also this assembly is going to have to decide whether we have the stomach to regulate that and that will save time too. So that means when we work through a process and deciding that we work through that process and voting on it. Mr. Bryson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Um, Ms. Wold just gave the best answer the whole night. What does the public want? Because it is going to make our job easier on how we come up with what to do with short-term regulate uh, SCRs. The only note that I've made was that from the first testimony that we received a year ago, if we make it really easy to be a one STR owner, maybe just fill out the one regulation form because the majority of the people that spoke for public testimony were single operators that were just wanting to be able to pay their house note. If we make their life easier and don't overburden them with regulations, then the people who do this as a job or as a, a business we can put the regulations to them and that's going to be part of their business practice to go through what uh, CBJ's requirements are. Uh, the only other caveat to that is that there is a service provider that handles multiple STRs but for multiple owners. So there's one provider that they might have STRs of their own but they provide service for multiple STRs and so if we could uh, just at least address or acknowledge ownership versus somebody who's operating for the owner. Um, I think we're on to something here. Thank you, Ms. Wall. Thank you, Ms. and Madam Deputy Mayor. Thank you, and I'll just weigh in. Um, I, I think that uh, I also uh, like the idea of a task force of some sort, like Task Force Light, like you said, so we don't get, we don't get too bogged down. Um, I do think that it is really important to bring the public along, and Ms. Wall, it's a great idea that a mayor, some of your task forces have really worked um, well. Um, so I like that idea. I'm not sure how, what it'll look like, but I'm sure uh, Madam Manager and Mr. Deputy Manager can bring us back uh, an idea or two. Um, I, I will say that short-term rentals serve a purpose, and that purpose is very broad. It's not just traveling uh, nurses and, and doctors. Um, it's not just, you know, making sure that one group or another is served. It is important uh, for, um, you know, independent travelers. However, this is a problem worldwide, and probably a lot of us, when we go traveling, like to stay in short-term rentals because it's handy. It's a house or an apartment or uh, something like that, and we get to cook. But we're taking up space in other people's communities when we do that as well. So um, that's where I'm at. So, Madam Manager, 
Does anyone have any further comments before we ask Madam Manager if we've given you something, or Mr. Deputy Manager, if we've given you something to work with? Uh, Mr. Kelly. Thank you. I, I'd like to thank uh, Ms. Wolf for bringing up the idea of a task force. I'm intrigued by the idea. Um, I think it's a very important to get the community's input on this. I would just um, perhaps caution or maybe express the hope that whatever task force is, is organized uh, would be balanced. So we'd have operators, we'd also have a variety of other community inputs. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. I think that's absolutely correct. Um, oh, Missy Scandies. Yeah, I would just add, I think Mr. Kelly kind of encapsulates, but it's really easy to get people out and want to be a part of something when you're affecting their pocketbook. But what we will have to work really hard the way we always do is the people we're not going to capture, the people who aren't sitting here in the audience are the people who either moved away because they couldn't find a rental or they're just busy and they're scrabbling to get by and they have a lot of passionate thoughts about short term rentals. So we really let's figure out whatever that public process is if you guys want to ask for us. Thank you. Madam Mayor, did you have a comment? So I guess the question to the body tonight is, do we want a task force or not? I mean, if we want a task force, then we'll set one up and we'll do it just like we said, you get a wide variety of the public. And I definitely agree with Ms. Wall. If we do the regular public process, we're gonna get the operators and that's what they're gonna say. But you know, I'm looking at Mr. Dahl in the audience um, from the chamber and his executive officer has been looking for five years to try and buy a house and she can't afford to buy one. So. Um, uh, so I guess the question is, do we want one? We'll set one up and we'll come back to the assembly and say, here's the charge and here's the people that we're suggesting. But so my question, without, without, without people saying, yes, we want one, we don't want to go to that work. My question to uh, the assembly members, is there anyone present that does not want to do a task force? I see Ms. Hughes-Gandys. I don't see anyone else. Do we need to take an official vote, Ms. Sue Scandies, or are we good with that? I think that's 8-1, <laughs> if you need to record that. I mean, I would object, but I I, I recognize I'm in the minority. Okay, so uh, super. I'll do the math, 8-1. <laughs> I, 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 th I think we, we have a yes, Madam Mayor. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, and Mr. Deputy Manager, do you have information to move forward? Uh, thank you all so much for the very good discussion and the discipline and the short answers. Uh, Madam Mayor. I, just, um, I forgot on my information. We got numbers, but if we could get more information on what type of, uh, what type of things these are, I mean, are they one bedroom, are they two bedrooms, are there houses, are they apartments? That would be real helpful if we can get that information. understanding the limitations of the very short form that we agreed to do last year. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on, Madam Manager, Telephone Hill. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Hale. I'd like to invite Nick, Nick, I'm gonna butcher your last name, Druvestein. <laughs> You're gonna have to correct that for me, up to give a presentation um, on uh, uh, update on Telephone Hill. We need something relatively brief from you all this evening. <laughs> no, no, you just happen to be across the... <laughs> we, we, uh, what we need, we understand that we brought this to you at the Feb uh, February 12th Committee of the Whole, this topic, and you gave really good guidance to us then to move forward on a, um, uh, dent, high density uh, option. Um, we understand that uh, what that looks like needs to include, you know, green space and needs to be thoughtful. And in order to like move that vision forward, we need some feedback from you on parking. So you can see here the recommendation um, in the memo is to um, extend the zero parking zone. Um, you recall that uh, a couple years ago you created a zero parking zone in downtown to address. Um, the uh, development uh, constraints, the cost constraints of developing you know, housing and, and other things downtown. And so our recommendation isn't to introduce an ordinance, but in order to vision these scenarios and be able to play them out to a point where then we can say, okay, what 
does CBJ need to do? Where's the public partner, private partnership enter? Uh, we need to have that information. So just uh, before I hand it over to Nick, I just want to let you know that like um, this isn't a you know final decision. Um, and there will also will be more opportunity to refine the vision that the assembly has. And this is uh, all trying to tee us up for some type of partnership of which I don't know exactly what it looks like. So I think we deal with a lot of chicken and egg issues here. So help, uh, help, be, the, help be the egg in, uh, in this. And I'll hand it over to oh, you. Here's but, presentation. But, but first, let me uh, just reiterate that at the very bottom of the page 17 um, in uh, the memo from Nick Driverstein. Okay, from Mr. Driverstein, um, staff is recommending extending the zero parking zone. And so that's what we're deciding now. We have lots and lots of conversation in the future. And Mr. Driverstein, you, you may have noticed that some of us at least are a little tired. So if you can like be very concise in your presentation, thank you. All right, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Nick Drivestein, and I'm with the uh, CBJ Department of Engineering and the project manager for the Telephone Hill Redevelopment Study. Um, and we were oh, uh, back here a couple of months ago, back in February, and uh, were given direction to proceed with a high density option for uh, housing on Telephone Hill. Um, we are getting it back. There we go. There we go. We can jump to the next slide. All right, so the update to um, the development option is uh, after giving uh, direction to proceed with design option C, uh, we, ban we began to um, refine the development concept, starting with figuring out what a developable area would look like, um, basically creating new parcels up there for which um, uh, new housing could be built. Uh, from the developable area, we go into figuring out the volume of building that could uh, occur. Uh, and generally, that'll tell you what sort of materials go into building um, a new construction. Um, and then from there, we start to uh, consider other factors, uh, things like maintaining accessibility and uh, view sheds and working with the topography of the hill um, so that it blends in and, and is more cost effective for development. Um, so as of right now, our latest concept has uh, four new buildings ranging in height from three to five stories. And in total, it would provide up to 155 new units of housing. And that'll be a combination of studio, one beds, and two beds. So uh, the first thing we had to figure out once, um, once we came to the conclusion of uh, what the buildings would look like is how do we develop the site to, um, to support those new buildings. And, um, from that, we, uh, we figured out a site preparation rough order magnitude cost estimate would be around $5 million. And that would include uh, demolishing the existing structure, upgrading utilities uh, to each of the new parcels, improving accessibility, and a full reconstruction of Dixon Street. Um, the, the high costs in that number uh, come mainly from rock, site, rock excavation, building demolition, introducing three-phase power, which is necessary for elevators, uh, and improvements to the stairways and sidewalks. So um, as Ms. Kester mentioned, uh, the sort of uh, uh, main issue with um, finalizing these site preparation documents is what do you do about parking? Well, it's obvious that there's not enough space um, on the surface of Telephone Hill to put a brand new lot in that would support all of the parking that would be necessary for new development. So we've been considering um, three different options, two of which uh, include underground parking. Uh, this uh, would be able to provide the necessary amount of required parking for new development based off of our current concepts uh, without taking up any extra land and uh, therefore taking away any additional housing. Um, so uh, according to city code, the required number of parking spaces for 155 new units uh, would be 68 new stalls. Um, as you can see, we, uh, we uh, provided a little bit extra for each of them. Uh, if you we look at design option one, this would include new garages under each of the uh, new proposed buildings and would uh, provide a total of 93 underground slots, uh, which more than uh, fulfills the requirement. Uh, looking at option two, that would just be the two main garages under the uh, largest buildings, buildings A and B, uh, and also include some on-street parking. 
uh, while option three would be the, um, the uh, extension to the zero parking area, uh, basically not requiring any new parking as a part of the development. Uh, if you look at the uh, numbers right on the right hand side there, those are the big costs associated with underground parking. Um, basically, you have to dig a hole down and then build up a structure from that uh, and then build a building pad so that you can construct uh, a building on top of that all. Um, and as you can see, the, the numbers are, are pretty large for that. Uh, these would just be, you know, the biggest costs for underground parking, probably about 75% of the total cost. Um, so if you look at design option one, it would be 93 new spaces, but you'd spend $6 million just on the excavation and the building of uh, the podium. Uh, and then there would be additional costs for design work, inspection work, and um, the finished work that goes into a parking garage, uh, including things like electrical HVAC, fire suppression, that kind of thing. So it all said uh, design option one would cost over $8 million and come out to about $90,000 per stall. Um, you can see some savings when you go into option two, um, taking out those additional garages, but it's still about two thirds of the total cost. Uh, while option three, there is some excavation to help widen the roadway, allow for on-street parking, uh, primarily for emergency access, uh, but that would be by far uh, less excavation than the other options. So looking forward to next steps, um, we're going to continue with the finalization of the site preparation documents. Uh, we'll incorporate uh, the parking scheme that is uh, best suited for Telephone Hill and also include uh, mitigation costs for potential hazardous materials encountered during uh, construction. Um, that would be in a report which we expect later this month and then after a review of that report we'll be able to, to put those numbers into our site prep cost estimate. Uh, once we have the site preparations all done for, we can start to go to the hilltop side of things and start determining landscapes, uh, building cost estimates, um, and all, all of the finishing touches to a, uh, a master plan. Uh, and then with that, we'll put in all of our support documentation that details our design development and how we got to the master plan that we have. Uh, and then once we have that master plan, we can go on to craft a scope of work and review criteria for, for future solicitations. Um, an additional uh, step that could be put in here uh, would be a, a mitigation plan for uh, historic resources. Uh, while staff was not directed to continue with a Section 106 review and our contractor has fulfilled the requirements that uh, uh, are with the Desktop 106 review, uh, it uh, still allows us to uh, take those mitigation measures uh, for future development to try and maintain the, the historic significance of the area. And that could mean something like uh, uh, commonly they, they do floor plans that uh, would facilitate a reconstruction of the house in the future if, if that was pursued, um, documenting uh, photograph documentation of the interior and exterior of the buildings, um, and uh, publishing documentation on the historic, historic and uh, existing characteristics of the site. Um, so that could uh, fit nicely into the next steps for a master plan if we so choose. Uh, thank you, Mr. Drivestein. Madam Manager, did you have anything you wanted to add about uh, the 106 process? Um, because we have gotten a lot of emails about that. No, I think uh, Mr. Drivestein um, addressed that and he's prepared to answer other questions if you have them. Okay, thank you. Um, I see Madam Mayor and then Mr. Bryson. Oh, Mr. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. I actually have two questions and I might go last too. Um, thank you uh, for giving us this uh, presentation tonight. Wouldn't a contractor and then eventually the residents of the apartment building, wouldn't they be the ones that paid for underground parking if that was the building design? It wouldn't necessarily be our cost. Thank you. Mr. Drivestein. It's a, a consideration that we're putting into it, um, mainly because it's kind of tied into the whole building cost and that if you, um, if you go forward with a developer to develop these new buildings, they're also gonna to have to put in parking as, as sort of that first step. So that cost is gonna to have to come up front 
Um, so it, it was one of our considerations. And, and Mr. Bryson, you had a second question. Go ahead. Um, is there anything preventing uh, a group to get organized that they could come and like take one of these houses to maybe a piece of land that is not smack dab in the middle of the city that we're trying to develop? Would it be possible to like lift up and move it to another location? Could a group come together and raise funds and then raise the house to some other location? Mm -hmm. um, from, from an engineering perspective, sure. I think they've done something similar up in Anchorage. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, it would, um, it would definitely have to be something that would be worked out in, in a future solicitation. But um, I, I don't see from the information that we have now why that wouldn't be possible. Thank you, Mr. Bryson. Madam Mayor. Yeah, I never two because of Mr. Bryson asked one. So I'm just going to ask it, Mr. Bryson's question a little bit different. Um, if we ended up recommending extending the zero parking zone, that doesn't mean a builder couldn't go in and provide parking, right? That is correct. Okay, and then my second question is, these are just options right now, because we asked you to bring us options, because as I recall, we also were talking about a little less units than 155. So as an assembly, we could say we need 100 units up there and just, and that was what we would just send out to the builders, correct? That's right, yeah. Um, our numbers are up two, and um, uh, there, there's not much room to put much more else, but we can certainly take some out. All right, thank you, Mr. Drivestein. Um, and I'll, I'll follow up on that. Um, when I say, because my intent, at least when we asked for options, was, you know, it, it felt like everything was too crowded. And so, like, I would envision, like, like a little park space or something like that where you could sit around and have coffee or something like that. So I'm, I'm hoping we can see some, you know, some more variety than what you came up with on page, uh, whatever the page is with the little, the four little white slides, um, just so we can think about different options and the numbers. Mr. Smith. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Um, Mr. Deverson, at the end of your presentation, you were hitting on it. Did you say you're, planning to pursue the kind of historical documentation or sorry what 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 did you say were the actual plans in place about that um so i was um i was talking about how at the end of a, a section 106 generally the the outcome is if a place does have historic significance um they'll put in a plan to mitigate any adverse effects to that historic significance or whatever those factors are um, during construction. You know, that doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, you can't touch anything up there or demolish any buildings, but um, it's about ensuring that the history will live on beyond the building. So um, th what I was um, referencing on, on typical outcomes of that would be uh, publishing documentation that says, you know, this is what was once there, um, doing floor plans so that there's, you know, documentation of how these were built, uh, in the construction behind them. Um, those, those are just what I've typically heard as uh, outcomes of a 106. Yep. Mr. Smith. Yeah, thank you for that. I, it's, it's something that I've been talking with some uh, members of the public about, and um, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm a supporter of, you know, not knowing what exactly is gonna happen to all those properties up there, but at least capturing their historical, whatever, their history before they are demolished or whatever happens. Um, and and there, we, there is a, we did just get a letter from the Hume Historic Resources Advisory Committee this afternoon um, talking about pursuing the, the, the Section 106. Um, and so, I, I don't know, I mean, when are we gonna bring this up again? It's something I'd like to, you know, discuss. I don't know if we need a, a motion or anything, but like, I would just like to make sure that we do some type of collection of historical information on these properties. But I don't know if we're ready to. I think uh, Madam Manager might have some input as well. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Yeah, just to clarify, um, I think what we're saying is that if there are elements of a Section 106 review that you would like to maintain without pausing the project to do a full Section 106, because you, you gave the direction at the February 12th committee meeting to not do that, we can incorporate that into this master plan that we are uh, we are working on for the site. So, the, so we would need direction from you to say, I want you to preserve historical elements such as 
uh, you know, photographs, um, and, and some of the other things that were mentioned. So I think that would be the times. So you certainly could give that direction now. You could give that direction as we move forward. And then when we go to solicit um, a contractor to do this work, we would include that direction in our um, scope of work. Did I get that correctly? Um, so I, I can't tell if you want us to give you that direction now or later. I mean, um, <laughs> that's a uh, that's a loaded question. Uh, I guess um, I, I don't feel like I have enough information to give you that direction at this point. And I see Miss Uscanny says. Yes. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Madam Chair. No, I was just going to say I I'm happy to hear I'm not crazy. <laughs> we already gave that direction, uh, and it is nice to be reminded that when we get further along in this process and we have chosen some model and we are actually getting much further along, then we can dial in, oh, maybe we should go take pictures or maybe someone should go take measurements as part of that process. But as far as direction, I feel like we already as an assembly gave the direction to keep things moving without a full 106. And so that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Mr. Smith. And I'm, I'm with you, Ms. Hale, in that I don't have enough, info, like, I just don't understand this historic documentation stuff well enough to, I just thought, like, we want to make sure we, like, you know, there was some, you know, there was some direction in this HRAC memo about this a HABs level three documentation, which I don't know anything about, but, like, anyway, it, I, I want to. I want to just make sure we capture the right stuff. I don't know what that is, and so maybe we could get hear more back about what this HABs Level Three documentation is suggested by HRAC means. And anyway, Madam Manager, Mr. Drivestein. I mean, I too received the uh, letter at the same time that you all did. I suppose the real question is, does the body want to revisit your decision to not do a section 106 review, or uh, do you want to just make sure, I, I, um, do we want to pause the project and revisit this question, or do we want to... Uh... Mr. Smith. Not, not at all what I'm suggesting. I guess I just... I want to make sure we collect the right stuff, and I'm not. And maybe it's this this Habs level three documentation. I don't know. I don't know if that means we're starting a 106. You know, like this is just so. I don't know any of this pro procedure on historical preservation stuff. So I'm, I'm grasping, but I just want to make sure we like take the photos and do the floor plans, and so that it's not the history isn't just gone to you know isn't just isn't just gone forever once we. In other words, we're not experts on this process, and we keep getting a lot of emails. So. Right, right. And, and I think, so the question is, like, back to the body, is what is the intention of, uh, you know, we can do any number of things up into a Section 106 review, which I am also not an expert on. Um, and I guess, so, so then, and this is difficult because it's late and, and we came to this meeting being like that decision has been made, but we'll be happy to answer questions on it. So um, I guess the question really would be is what do we, uh, if, if we're not pursuing a, a, a traditional section 106 review that has uh, boxes to check, then what is the um, nature of the, the value for that information. And that's where we, if we get that feedback from the body, hey, we want to have this information for future generations to preserve our history. Uh, you know, we, if we can get that outside of a section 106 review, then we can design a process that preserves that information. If, if the intent is um, a section 106 review, then we should probably just do a section 106 review. Thank you. Um, we have Mr. Kelly. Uh, and then we have Mr. Bryson, and then we have Madam Mayor, and so let's go go have a little conversation among us, and then we'll kind of keep keep coming back. Yeah, Mr. Kelly. Thank you. I, I originally wanted to comment on on something else, but I think perhaps um, a, a solution to Mr. Smith's um, and uh, perhaps all of our dilemmas 
might be to have more information brought back to us at the next uh, land housing and, and economic development committee so we can make a decision um, a more informed decision at that point um, what I I guess but before I make my comment I'd like to maybe ask a question to the manager would that process um, overly delay any sort of progress that you're hoping to make madam manager um, if we were to Put this on the agenda for the next finance meeting. Um, is the question on the agenda to revisit a section 106 review or the topic of um, what we can do to uh, pr for historical preservation? Mr. Kelly. Thank you. I I think what I'm gathering from from Mr. Smith, and he can correct me if I'm wrong, but maybe the historical preservation is probably not losing something permanently. I think is what's most of the most interest. Yeah. Um, I, I will look to uh, you, but I feel like that we could absolutely do that, and that would be within the timeline of the project, and, and part of staff has already been thinking about ways to incorporate uh, that work in a solicitation. Thank you. I, I did have a comment on another matter, but I, it, I'm not the only one in line. So. Yeah, let's go ahead and do these, and then we'll come back to you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Bryson. We have asked and answered this question. This body, body voted to move Telephone Hill forward without a 106, and no information has come forth that would correct that decision. Like, we haven't had new information. We, make, we had all this information. We knew what the properties were. We knew we were trying to develop them. We knew we wanted to take pictures. People have talked about taking pictures of these homes since we got Telephone Hill. And with all of that same information that we have right now, we said we have voted to move Telephone Hill forward. And so I'm really hesitant to go back and do a historical review that highlights the time period that white families took over property. If we go back 50 years, there would be different family names or different families on that location. We're going to pick this one moment in time that represents when uh, white colonization was happening to Southeast Alaska and say, we need to honor and, and protect those homes in that history. This is like the worst part of the history. If a group wants to come and take the house and do something special with it, they can go take it and do something special with it. We won't stand in their way. But we said no to 106 because we're gonna actively move this forward because it's the best use for the whole community not for 16 families and the small group that wants to hold up this project. The best property in the middle of downtown that, is, that has been begged to be developed, we need to move forward with this. I would say we put this discussion to bed and move forward with what we already said, that the direction that we already gave staff. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bryson. Madam Mayor. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Um, we have said we're not the experts this, but lo and behold, we have museum people that are the experts at documenting historical stuff. Imagine that. So I would say have the staff, with all their staff, get together and figure out how to document these historical stru structures and don't rely on anything that we have to check boxes on. I think we'll just end up with the delays if we do. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And uh, I'm going to speak and then we'll go back to, to Mr. Uh, Kelly, um, I, uh, I actually don't think anyone on this dais has suggested that we do a, a Section 106 review. I have not heard that at all. I didn't hear that from Mr. Drivenstein or from Madam Manager. Um, we, we, as Madam Mayor says, we don't, we're, we're not experts in, in the Section 106 process. I think that you have a kind of an outline um, working with the museum staff and bringing that information it, it, to the Lands and Housing Committee, not holding anything up, not looking for a decision, just telling us more about what it is that you're proposing to do. Um, so, Mr. Kelly, you have something else. Uh, thank you, and I think um, my comment was more um, is more on a different subject. Uh, more along the lines, I think, of the recommendation that the manager is hoping to get from us, which is uh, the nature of the parking situation for these um, these units. Uh, 
I, I do feel, um, I think Mr. Bryson raised a good point that we're actually not the ones that will be constructing this. And so it's probably more up to the developers and, and, um, and others. But when it comes to extending the zero lot line, I think I can per speak from personal experience that I don't think that's a good idea. I used to, uh, my first um, two places when I moved to Juneau were apartments downtown. And one of them was a very large multi-story apartment that offered no parking. It was, it was always a challenge. Um, it's not a challenge I would like to exasperate um, in a place where we already have difficulty finding parking. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kelly. Uh, Madam Mayor, did you have a motion? Certainly, Madam Chair. We'd love to give you a motion. Thank you. Um, I move that we recommend staff extend the zero parking zone to include Telephone Hill. And if I may talk to this. Yes, please. Um, that's why I asked one of my questions. If a developer is going to build, let's just say, fancy condos, he's going to have to provide parking for fancy condos. If we make enough money selling these lots, then we could probably look at putting one, two, or three floors to the parking garage. That's my plans with the money. I know we haven't talked to this assembly about it, but if we, we have learned from experience, um, Second and Franklin is a perfect example, that if we put a bunch of uh, restrictions on housing downtown, then we just get zero housing. So that's why I'm making my motion. Are there any objections? Mr. Kelly. I think I've already spoken to it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there further uh, objections or comments? I, I do have one comment, um, and then we'll call uh, call the, for the vote. Um, whatever we do with City Hall, you know, we talked about three options, and we're moving forward, looking at the Burns building. Madam Manager has talked about that freeing up a lot of spaces in parking garages all that, that we have. And that's a ways, you know, it's down at the, uh, where the, where the library is, but, um, but that will free up something like 160 spaces. Um, and the other point, you know, you've all heard me harp on the bus, et cetera. Um, this is an incredibly pedestrian friendly location. I envision a nice set of stairs, going down to the street that goes in front of the state office building. Um, I lived up by the Capitol for a couple of years. I walked everywhere. I didn't even have a car. Um, you can walk to the grocery stores and you get a lot of exercise on that Stairmaster. So um, I'm with the motion. Are there further comments? Uh, Madam Clerk, will you please uh, Madam Deputy Mayor. Uh, yes, Mr. Kelly. I think you raised a few points I hadn't considered and I'll withdraw my objection. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. So we have no objections and um, that motion passes. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. And Madam Manager, do you have clear direction from us? I do, I appreciate. Uh, if I can just reiterate, the direction is to um, move forward with designing with uh, zero parking as if we were extending zero parking. Also, the direction is to bring back to the assembly, um, working with staff, next time we talk about Telephone Hill, ways to preserve the historic nature of uh, that um, neighborhood and uh, ways to document the historic nature of that neighborhood. Um, not uh, not up to a section 106, but certainly learning from some of the important elements of a section 106 uh, that provide that valuable information and bring that to you next time we uh, talk about this topic. Uh, thank you, and also to bring us more options. Um, and Ms. Uskandis, you have a... Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. I think we, people were on their own, everybody was in their own tornado when 106 came up. And uh, I don't think we're on a page about that as an assembly. And if you, I know we all want to get out of here right now. Maybe if you want to do a quick uh, question would be one suggestion if people, and then if people who are into that direction that the manager just stated can uh, positively affirm that that's what they want to happen, then that would be great. And maybe- Do you want to make a motion, Ms. Uskandis? I would be voting against that motion. Well, you so can make no, a I motion and, and object if you want, just so that we can move this right along. Um, 
I guess I would say if you are. Oh, Mr. Smith might Sorry. have. Okay, great. I, I was just going to say maybe we need to just take a little step back. I can look into this a little more. I feel like we're, no, I don't know. Anyway, I feel like we just won't, don't have the information to, let, if, if fine, let me, I can, maybe I can just look into what these different options are and I can better understand and come back to the body or something at a later time. Anyway, I just. Working with Madam Manager and Mr. Drivers sign. Yes, and the HRAC. I mean, we can look at their letter and see what, see what those things are. I just. Uh, I think, uh, I, um, no. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you, Madam Manager. Oh. I really do think that, um, it is part of the original intention of our project team to incorporate uh, some level of historic uh, documentation. And so if you don't mind um, the team just doing that work as part of our original intention, and then, and of course, Assemblymember Smith, we should work together to make sure that uh, you know, you understand what that is. I, I do think that that's a logical and a practical next step that's not overly burdensome to the timeline of the project or uh, staff capacity. And it really is a natural part of, of the project. Mr. Kelly, and, and then let's wrap it up. We're Thank you, uh, just a simple, yeah. That, I, I just uh, request that I be looped in as well, if that's possible. Thank you. Are you satisfied? All right. Uh, thank you. We are adjourned at 927.